Act One of Madame Pepita by Gregorio Martina Sierra, translated by John Garrett Underhill, 1876 to 1946. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Characters Madame Pepita, aged 38, read by Avaí. Catalina, aged 17, read by Jen Broda. Galatea, aged 25, read by Matea Bracic. Carmen, aged 28, read by Devora Allen. Christina, aged 16, read by Sonia. A sewing girl, aged 20, read by Son of the Exiles. Don Guillermo, aged 40, read by Adrian Stevens. Alberto, aged 22, read by Thomas Peter. Don Louis, aged 55, read by Todd. Augusto, aged 25, read by Andrew Gantz. Andres, aged 30, read by David Purdy. Stage directions read by Michael Max. Act 1. Reception Salon in the establishment of Madame Pepita, a fashionable dressmaker. The room is elaborately fitted out with gold furniture, upholstered in silk, but too elaborate for good taste. In the centre and at the right, small tables strewn with fashion magazines, coloured plates of French and Viennese models, and samples of materials such as wholesale houses supply to dressmakers. A large three-panelled mirror in front of a pier glass reaching to the floor points to the fact that on busy days the salon is pressed into service as a fitting room also. One or two smart hats hang about on high stands. Almost in the centre of the stage is a dress form on which is draped an elaborate evening gown. At the rise of the curtain, Carmen, one of Madame Pepita's fitters, is kneeling before the form, pinning a design of flowers and foliage on the gown. She pauses every now and then to compare the result with the fashion plate which she takes from the floor at her side in order to examine it more closely. Christina stands nearby, handing her pins from a small box, besides flowers and buds from a large carton which is placed on a chair. Carmen, a smart-looking young person, of the type employed in the better dressmaking establishments of Madrid, wears a black frock set off with a small white apron. Her shoes are neat, and her hair and general appearance faultlessly correct. Christina, an apprentice, still in short skirts, is well-groomed and smart. Both girls speak with the easy sophistication of the capital, but without marked vulgarity. Give me a pin, a rose, a bud, quick. You're not in any hurry, are you? Well, you'll see what will happen if the snapdragon appears upon the scene and this dress isn't finished. Catalina, a girl of seventeen, enters, innocent and attractive in appearance. She is horribly dressed, and her hair is done frightfully. Although her clothes are well cut and of good material, her skirt is on crooked and dips down on one side, her blouse gapes where it fastens, and her apron, which is made of lace and batiste of excellent quality, is decorated with a huge ink spot. Her skirt is neither long nor short, while her hair hangs loose, except for a large bow tied where it does the least good. In moments of abstraction, she bites her nails furiously. In one hand, she carries a book. Her conversation is that of a spoiled child who is aware of her importance as daughter of the head of the establishment. Catalina, entering, overhearing Carmen's last words. See here, you needn't call my mother the snapdragon. She has a name like everybody else. 
Tiri, you're a sweet ghost. You always appear when you're not wanted. Whether I'm wanted or not is none of your business. Excuse me, Tiri. Catalina, walking over and seating herself in an armchair. You needn't excuse yourself, but be a little careful what you say. I'm here. Cuddling herself down into the chair like a cat. And I'm not as silly as you think. She opens the book and begins to read to herself, evidently with great difficulty. Carmen, under her breath. Little Miss Noetal is not as silly as you think. Catalina, turning quickly. See here, you needn't call me Little Miss Know-It-All. I've got a name like everybody else. What you've got is a consumptive's quick ear. Catalina, much offended. Come sumpt of yourself. Christina, intervening. Ah, uh, now, don't be cross. It was only a joke. Catalina, immediately appeased. That's all right, but be a little careful with your jokes. My name is Catalina, I'll have you know, and my mother is not the snapdragon. She's the signora, the head of this establishment. Carmen, maliciously. The madam. No, sir, not the madam. Madame Pepita, which is very different. Insisting. Madame Pepita, Madame Pepita. We heard you, dearie. Maliciously. Well, then. If Madame Pepita comes in and this trimming isn't finished, the head of this establishment is going to create a disturbance that will make a hurricane seem tame. And quite right, too, because you're lazy things, all of you. Wise talk, eh, from the pet of the house. Why don't you turn in and help? Catalina, scornfully. I? You've got cheek. Turning her back, she begins to read again, applying herself laboriously, pronouncing each syllable as children do when they learn. The human body consists of three parts, head, trunk, and extremities. Repeating without looking at the book. The human body consists of three... A bell rings at the entrance, which is at the head of the stairs. Carmen, to Christina. Look and see who is coming. The doorbell rang. Christina, glancing towards the door upon the right. It's the boy from the silk shop. Alberto appears in the doorway. He is a youth of twenty-two, unusually well-educated, of good family, whom reverses have obliged to seek employment as a clerk in La Sultana, silk, lace and haberdashery shop. He dresses plainly but respectably, and displays the excessive timidity of a person who feels himself above his position. He is delivering a large number of boxes containing laces. Alberto, hesitating before he enters. May I? With your permission, I beg your pardon. The two girls do not answer, as they are busy laughing. Good morning. Catalina. Raising her eyes from her book, instantly attracted by the young man. As the scene progresses, little by little, her attitude alters from sympathy to admiration. The actress should mark the transition simply and ingeniously, as the girl's innocence does not permit her to realise its significance. Good morning. Do you wish anything? Alberto, advancing a few steps. Smiling timidly. Here are the laces from La Sultana, so that you may select what is required. Very well. You may leave them and return a little later. Alberto, timidly. But, pardon me, the proprietor wishes me to bring back what you do not desire. When all the laces are here and ladies call at the shop, naturally we have nothing to show. Well, madame has a fitting at present. She has no time to make selections now. The idea? You wouldn't refuse to oblige a lady, would you, just because your employer tells you to? No, indeed. I shall retire then with your permission and return later. Backing awkwardly toward the door, in his embarrassment he collides with a chair, which, 
in falling, carries with it a table loaded with fashion plates, both crashing down together. Greatly disconcerted, Alberto attempts to gather up the scattered papers, becomes entangled, proceeds to extricate himself, finally almost falling in his turn. The two girls burst out laughing, while Catalina rushes toward him with a cry. Catalina, hurrying to Alberto. Oh, did you hurt yourself? Alberto, smiling in spite of his confusion, but looking askance at the two girls who are still laughing. No, senorita, thank you very much. Won't you let me get you a glass of cold water? Oh, no, senorita, it is quite unnecessary. The girls continue to laugh. Catalina, turning to the girls. I don't see what you're laughing at. Can't we laugh if we feel like it? Not when there's nothing to laugh at. Never mind, senorita, they are laughing at me. When a man trips, it invariably amuses the ladies. I suppose it seems only natural. <laughs> yes, we can teach you anything. Catalina to Alberto, confidentially. They're stupid things, both of them. Alberto, gratefully. You are an angel, senorita. Catalina, drawing away, half shyly, half surprised. Am I? During this episode, the girls have returned to their task of trimming the gown. Carmen, kneeling on the floor, leans backward better to sense the effect, and presently makes a gesture of dissatisfaction. This can't be right. I don't think so either. It's too broad. There's too much of it. Carmen, rising and taking the sketch in her hand. Well, it is exactly like the drawing, and that is awfully smart. I don't know what it is. Alberto, interrupting. B pardon me. Snatching the sketch from Carmen, who looks up astonished. The lines of this model were designed for the ideal woman, a woman with a figure built on Gothic lines. His self-assurance now offers a striking contrast to his former embarrassment. What? Alberto, smiling, looking from one to the other as if making a demonstration in mathematics. I mean to say that she has very long legs. Say no. I am sure of it. Estimating the height of the plate with his eye and measuring it off with one finger, as painters do. One, two, three. We have exactly eight heads. Eight heads? Alberto, smiling pleasantly. Yes, senorita, that is, in total height. And the lady for whom you are making this gown must be only... Glancing at the dress form. Let me see. One, two, three... With perfect assurance. We may give her five and a half. <laughs> five and a half. Heads? Carmen, sarcastically. Five and a half heads ought to seem a lot to you. Alberto, intensely serious. No, not at all. Five and a half are not nearly enough. The ideally proportioned figure has a total height of seven heads. That is the Greek type in all its purity and elegance. French and Viennese models always exaggerate somewhat, but Spanish women, particularly here in Madrid, are rather Romanesque in contour, like... To Christina... Like you, senorita. Like me? <laughs> Don't be offended. I mean, wide and thick. So, when we attempt to adapt the ideal lines of the model to the shapes which we actually see, the result is ridiculous. Waxing eloquent as he studies the garment. Three parallel rows of trimming on a short skirt. Horrible. And the pity of it is... For just as long as women neglect to study the divine mysteries of line, they will continue to go about looking as if their worst enemies had designed their clothes. It breaks a man's heart to go out for a walk and meet masterpieces of the Creator transformed into monstrosities by the sacrilegious criminal hands of tailors and dressmakers. <laughs> Carmen, half amused, half angry. 
What was that about tailors and dressmakers? Alberto, recollecting himself, his customary timidity returning as he realises what he has said. Please excuse me. I wasn't thinking of you. Catalina, who has been listening in open-mouthed admiration. But who are you? How do you know so much? I am nobody, senorita. I amount to nothing. Only I draw a little. I sketch. And I hope to become a painter some day. In the meantime, I am working in La Sultana, silk, lace, and haberdashery shop. I shall retire now, with your permission, ladies. Goes out. A moment of astonished silence follows. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> he's a scream. I don't see what makes you call him a scream. I think he's awfully nice and attractive. <laughs> attractive and everything else. So Don Simplicity has turned your head, has he? Catalina, almost in tears. I don't see what makes you call him Don Simplicity. He's got a name like everybody else. But we don't know his name. Yes, we do. It's Alberto. Catalina, to herself. Alberto, what a nice name. Madame Pepita is heard talking outside. Oh, here comes Mama. Carmen, resuming work precipitately. Oh, goodbye, my wages. To Christina. Give me another pin. Madame Pepita, outside. Yes, yes, I tell you, yes. A sewing girl, outside. But, madam... Madame Pepita enters. She is still a fine-looking woman. Her tailored suit is strictly in the mode, and her coiffure arranged with extreme care. She carries an elaborately trimmed sleeve in one hand, talking and gesticulating immoderately as she enters, evidently in great annoyance. At the same time, she is careful to maintain a noticeable affectation of refinement. The sewing girl follows deferentially. There is no but about it. I tell you the sleeve is a botch and a botch it is. You'll rip it this very minute and baste it over again and say nothing, and if that doesn't suit you, you can go. The idea of a little monkey like you presuming to defer with me in a matter of taste. But I didn't say anything. So much the better. Here, take your sleeve. Throws it at the girl, who catches it. The thing's a nightmare. It's about as chic as you are. To think I pay this girl six pesetas a week. Sewing girl, between her teeth as she goes out. Anyone who stands you ought to be paid six hundred. Catalina, going up to Madame Pepita. Mama, do you hear what she says? She says anyone who stands you ought to be paid six hundred. Is that your business? Oh. Madame Pepita, approaching Carmen and Christina. What are you doing? Wasting time, as usual? Why aren't you in the workroom? We were finishing this gown for exhibition. Madame Pepita, examining the model through her lorgnette, which is attached to an extravagantly bejeweled chain. And a sweet exhibition it is. Don't you like it? It might do for the patron saint of your village, which is in the back country. Way back, if one is to judge by the taste. I was born in Madrid the same as you. Then, my dear, your taste is bad, naturally. It's an exact copy of the model as you ordered. Won't you look? Hands her the sketch. Madame Pepita examines the gown and the model alternately through her lorgnette. Catalina, breaking in eagerly, perfectly sure of herself. But the model was designed for a woman built on Gothic lines. Madame Pepita, looking at her daughter, alarmed. What's that? Of course. The lady who ordered this is Romanesque. What are you talking about? Yes, Romanesque. She has only seven heads, and to be true to type with perfect proportion, you must have... Stops to sink. 
Oh, a great many more. I don't know just how many. And if you put three rows of trimming on a short skirt, why, the woman who wears it will go around looking like a Greek monstrosity whose worst enemy has made her clothes. Breaks off suddenly. There. Just see if I'm not right. Madame Pepita, alarmed. Child, have you a temperature? Come here, let me see. No, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? Nothing, Madame. We just heard all that rigmarole from the boy from La Sultana. Has the boy from La Sultana been here? With the laces. The same boy? No, another one, madame. Did you tell him that he was no good and that the proprietor is a cheat and an extortioner? Carmen, smiling. No, madame. You missed a fine opportunity. I'll tell him when I see him. Catalina, aroused. No, don't you do it, Mama. Is that your business? Catalina, moving off, suppressed. Oh. Carmen, pointing to the dress form. What shall we do with this? Take it to pieces and pin it together all over again. But not here. People will be coming soon and the whole place is a mess. Carry it into the workroom. I'll be there in a minute. Get out of my sight. Carmen, with her tongue in her cheek. Yes, madame. Picking up the form with Christina's help and carrying it out, muttering between her teeth as she does so. With the greatest of pleasure. Catalina, approaching her mother. Mama, she says, with the greatest of pleasure. Is that your business? Oh. What are you doing here? Idling? No, Mama, I am studying. Is that so? Let me see that book. Is it a novel? Catalina, protesting. No, Mama, it's a book Don Guillermo lent me. Don't you know? The gentleman on the floor above. It is, really, if you want to see it. Giving her the book. Madame Pepita, turning the pages. Heavens and earth, what's this? A skeleton? Catalina, as pleased as a child. Yes, Mama. It's a book that tells how many bones we have and how we are made inside and out. Eh? And what everything inside us is for. Reciting. The human body consists of three parts. Head, trunk. Madame Pepita, interrupting, scandalized. Hush, hush. That's immoral. Throw the book away this minute. Such things are only for men to know. No decent woman has any occasion to study her insides. Catalina, innocently. Oh, yes, Mama, she has. Don Guillermo says that women are just the ones who ought to know, so that when they grow up and become mothers, they can nurse their own children as God intended. Madame Pepita, sincerely shocked. The man's a satyr. Catalina, innocently. Oh, no, Mama. You mustn't say that. He writes articles for the papers, and he's a member of the Academy. Madame Pepita, softening as if by magic. A member of the Academy? Who told you so? The janitor's wife. She saw it on his letters, and it's on the papers, too, that come to him from the printers. Don Guillermo de Armendariz y Ochoa, from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. Yes, Mama. Besides, he's awfully nice and awfully sweet to me, and he has his rooms all stuffed full of big pieces of stone and statues that haven't any heads, and whenever he meets me on the stairs, he always stops to talk to me, and he's told me he'll lend me books so that I can learn something, because he thinks it's a great pity that I am such a big girl and such an ignoramus, and he asked why you didn't send me to school when I was little. I told him that you didn't want me to associate with common children." And he says that it is better to be common than to be ignorant. And that's true, isn't it, Mama? Madame Pepita, abstracted, impressed. A member of the Academy? Yes, Mama. And the other day he had his picture in the Nuevo Mundo with the King and Queen. With the King? Yes, Mama. At the opening of the picture exhibition, he was there to receive them and explain everything so that they could tell which were the good pictures and which were the bad ones. You can see them all here for yourself. Producing a copy of the Nuevo Mundo, which is concealed among the fashion plates. 
He has medals all over and wears a sash. Madame Pepita impressed. Probably the order of Carlos III. Or maybe he's Maria Luisa. Mollified, gazing at the photograph. How attractive a man does look when he's decorated. The doorbell rings, after which Carmen's voice is heard outside. Yes, Signor Conde. Will the Conde step in? I'll tell Madame. Appearing in the doorway and discovering Madame Pepita. Oh, here is Madame Pepita. Madame, the Conde de la Vega de Leso. Madame Pepita, suddenly becoming sweeter than honey. Conde, come in, come right in. Giving her daughter a hasty push. Go and dress yourself. You stand there in the middle of the room. You're a sight. Oh! Runs out, escaping by one door as Conde enters by the other. Don Luis de Lara, Conde de la Vega de Lezo, though but fifty-five, is in appearance much older. Love, wine and other excesses having undermined his health prematurely. Nevertheless, he still affects the airs and graces of the bow, which contrasts lamentably with the general decay of his person. He dresses with undue pretense to fashion, carrying himself gallantly in the grand style, though his gestures and poses are marred for the most part by his premature senility. He wobbles and totters and bends forward unexpectedly, which causes him the keenest annoyance. Kissing the girl, who opens the door as he enters, he appears to be dispensing a favour. The girl receives the salute with ill-concealed disgust, wiping her face with her apron as soon as the conde's back is turned. Then she goes out. My dearest Pepita. I was afraid the conde had forgotten us. It is three months since we have seen you. Oh, my dear, I have been travelling. Troubles and worries without number. I have not been well. The Conde has been ill? Yes, mental anguish, moral suffering, that is all. Society is in bad case, Pepita. The aristocracy has degenerated. Money is replacing blue blood nowadays, and it is prejudiced against the nobility. Poverty devours our vellum riches. We are nobodies. Oh, don't say that, Conde. Money cannot purchase blue blood. <sighs> no, blue blood cannot be bought nor sold either, for that matter. Be seated, Conde. Ah, Pepita, who would believe that your dear departed mother had lived in our house, that she had acted as maid to my departed wife? Madame Pepita, unduly affected. Your poor wife. Yes, you were born in our house. Brought up under the protection of my wing. Looking about the room. But today you travel the road to riches, while I... Madame Pepita, cantering promptly. Conde, I have troubles of my own, believe me. Come, come. Don't tell me you'll ever hang for want of a couple of thousand besetters. Conde, what put that idea in your head? A dressmaker invests her entire capital in clothes. These gowns cost me a fortune, and just as soon as the style changes, nobody will look at them. Then I have to pay wages to no end of girls, and finally there are the customers. They grow meaner and meaner every day. Even the actresses and the demi-mondaines who only a little while ago never dreamed of questioning the price of anything, would you believe it, nowadays the way they scrutinize their bills is something shameful. They know what everything, down to a yard of satin, costs. Why, Conde, I had a lady here the other day, the wife of a cabinet minister, 
I'd rather not mention her name, who insisted upon supplying her own trimming for a court costume. Fancy! Trimming! To me! What next, I wonder? She said the lace was antique, it had a history. I thought to myself it's antique all right. As for the history, there's plenty of that that's not so antique in which your husband figures conspicuously. It is the way of the world, Pepita. Uh, dressmaking is not what it used to be, Conde. Come, come. You have landed a scorial, which is money assured. Everybody knows you have property. What good is a little property when you haven't the money to build? Your daughter will be one of the finest matches in Spain. Madame Pepita fluttered. Oh, Conde, how can you say that? I have a soft spot in my heart for you, Pepita. Thank you, Conde. You are an exceptional woman, enterprising, systematic, who has exquisite taste. At each additional flattery, Madame Pepita swells with pride, blushing with excess of emotion. I express my admiration freely whenever I can find the opportunity. I am more than grateful, Conde. Today, I have come with a purpose. Conde? A lady will arrive shortly, naturally at my suggestion, who wishes to order some clothes. A relative of the Condes? Don Louis, with a superior air. No, she is not of my world, socially. Rather, I should say, of the artist class. Her name is Galatea. A stage name, of course. You must have heard of her. Something quite out of the ordinary. Mm, High-class vaudeville, don't you know? Living pictures. Oh, yes, of course. Stunning creature. Exquisite. She has been in despair in Madrid over the problem of clothes. She can find nothing appropriate. With a deprecatory gesture. Finally, I said to her, Why not see Madame Pepita? I am overwhelmed, Conde. So now she is coming to you. The difficulty is, at least I assume it is, she treats me like a father, or even more so. Although she is fond of me, there are some subjects we never discuss. However, I am convinced that somewhere in the background there must be somebody who pays the bills. Tragic, is it not? But obviously that is not our affair. Madame Pepita, innocently. Certainly not, as long as they are paid. Naturally, that is understood. I might suggest that in fixing the price... The Conde knows that my prices are not exorbitant. As the lady is a friend of his... No, no, that is not it exactly. Permit yourself, for once, the luxury of a few hundred pesetas more or less. Shall we say a thousand more? Madame Pepita responds with a gesture of astonishment. Times are hard. I could use seven hundred and fifty myself, which you may set aside for me when the bill is paid. Unless, of course, you care to advance them, if it is not inconvenient. But, Conde... Don Louis, affecting depression, pacing up and down the room. Ah, oh, sad, Pepita, is it not? Democracy has reduced us to this. A con de la vega de lezo accepting commissions upon clothes. Think of it. I shed tears. Madame Pepita, capitulating. Don't feel too badly, Conde. If there's anything I can do... Don Louis, simulating feeling. Thanks, Pepita. 
embracing her. I accept it because your heart is pure gold. But it demeans me. Not at all, Conde. The doorbell rings. Galatea's voice is heard outside. Is Madame Pepita in? Here she is. I recognize her voice. Transported. Ah, her voice. Advancing to the door. This way, Galatea. Hurrying forward to offer his hand. Galatea, a woman of twenty-five, displays an extremely smart street costume, somewhat over-elaborate, but nevertheless in good taste. Her manners and speech are vulgar, contrasting with her appearance and indicating that she has been brought up among the least sensitive of the lower classes. Galatea, to the Conde. So you're here, are you? Don Louis. Obsequious and infatuated, losing all his grand manner at once. Yes, I am here, as you see, whispering naughty things about you. I am interested in whatever you do. Well, I'll have to credit you one for getting up early, and it was cold this morning, too. I am capable of any sacrifice for your sake. The sacrifice will come later, but remember... I don't count asthmatic attacks any sacrifice. Asthmatic attacks? A great joke. Is this the Madame Pepita you talk so much about? Yes, indeed. At your service. Galatea, as affable with Madame Pepita as she is abrupt with the Conde. I am charmed. The pleasure is mine. The Conde informs me that you are very particular in the matter of clothes. Usually I think clothes so commonplace. I am sure that we have something which will appeal to your tastes. I suppose you are frightfully expensive. Quality is always expensive. However, I do not believe that we shall defer over the price. You may have absolute confidence in Pepita. Although not nobly born, she holds herself high. Whenever the Conde speaks, Galatea stares at him contemptuously, looking him over from head to foot, but he simulates entire obliviousness. You embarrass me, Conde. To Galatea. Have you any ideas, or would you prefer to look over some of our models first, so as to see what we have? Yes, perhaps you might show me something. If madame will step into the other room? I am anxious to see your display. Don Louis, unable to resist. Quite right. Step this way. No, trot along. You're excused. Dressmakers despise nothing so much as men who hang about fitting rooms. Oh, no, indeed. If it is any pleasure to the Conde... Well, if you don't mind, I do. That settles it. Don Louis, visibly disappointed. Always clever and coy. Yes, it's the way I'm made. I must be off, then. I have business of my own to attend to. Does your motor happen to be at the door, by any chance? What do you want of my motor? Don Louis, smiling. Nothing of your motor, but I should like permission from you to ride in it as far as my house. Galatea, after a moment's hesitation. Very well. If you send it right back, mind that you don't smoke and get my cushions all smelling of tobacco, because when I'm alone, I don't care to be reminded that there are such things as men in the world. Fanning the air with her handkerchief. Oof! Au revoir, Pepita. Goodbye. By the way, attend to that little matter as soon as possible. The need is urgent. I shan't forget, Conde. The Conde goes out. Galatea, as he disappears, utterly indifferent as to whether he overhears or not. Silly ass. Side-splitting, isn't he? And he thinks he's a sport. 
Madame Pepita, alarmed, fearing the Conde may hear. Oh, but the Conde is so distinguished. He's just in his prime. Yes, prime for a mummy in a museum. My God, I'm no use for antiques, not even when they're gold-lined. Men oughtn't to be allowed after they are twenty. These hangovers disgust me. <sighs> Madame Pepita lifts the curtain at the door leading to the fitting room and ushers Galatea out. For a moment the stage is empty. Then the bell rings and Carmen enters with Augusto. Augusto is a young man of twenty-five, whose sole preoccupation is the care and adornment of his person. He is dressed in an ultra-fashionable, light-coloured morning suit, which is slightly effeminate in effect. His shirt, tie, shoes, in short, all the articles of his attire blend in a harmony of delicate hues. He sports a velour hat whose soft, wide brim, turned up on one side and down on the other, rivals the meticulous lure of the coquette. His blonde hair billows above his brow in sweeping waves, one or two of which break gracefully over his forehead. His moustache is equally exquisite, yet in spite of his preciosity and affected speech, there is something about his person which is undeniably attractive. Carmen, obsequiously. Do step in, Signor Visconde, and be seated. I will deliver the message. My God, how sweet that man smells! Augusto, deigning to accept the proffered chair, but without sitting down. Thanks awfully. Did the Visconde meet his father, the Conde, on the stairs? Meet my father? No. Carmen, seeking a pretext to prolong the conversation. The Conde left a moment ago. Did he? Tell Madame Pepita that I am here. That is, if she is disengaged. Certainly. If the Visconde has a moment to spare, Madame is with a customer, an actress. Perhaps you have heard the name? Galatea. Galatea? When did she arrive? Half an hour ago, Visconde. She is selecting models with Madame. Let me see her at once. Galatea? No, Madame Pepita. Yes, Visconde. Do not tell her that I am here, but say it is urgent. Remember, not one word to Galatea. No, Visconde. She will be with you directly. Holy Mother, what beautiful nails. Goes out examining her own. Augusto, smiling fatuously. It cannot be helped. I wonder what they see. He looks at himself in the three-panelled mirror then in the pier-glass, then in a hand-mirror which lies upon the table, adjusting some detail of his suit, tie, or hair at each. Pulling a chain to which a small bottle of perfume is attached from his trousers' pocket, he pours a few drops upon his handkerchief. Then he takes a small comb from a case and deftly fluffs the waves of his hair. Then he twists the ends of his moustache between his thumb and forefinger, makes a circuit of the mirrors again, and, finally selecting a slender Egyptian cigarette from an incredible case, lights it with a patent lighter before sitting himself down to smoke, seated midway between the two mirrors, from which point of vantage he is able to survey himself upon all sides at once. He is interrupted in this agreeable occupation by Madame Pepita, who enters hurriedly, followed by Carmen. Madame Pepita, to Carmen. But why all this mystery? Will you tell me who wants to see me? What is the matter with you anyhow? Augusto, remaining seated, without deigning to remove his eyes from the mirror. Pepita, it is I. Visconde. Augusto directs a killing glance at Carmen, 
who responds with a look of admiration. Carmen, as she goes out. When he looks at you, it's divine. Augusto, twirling his moustache complacently, without taking his eyes from the glass. Yes, Pepita, it is I. Don't call me Visconde, call me what you used to when you lived with us. Madame Pepita, ravished. Oh, Senorito Augusto. Augusto, still more condescendingly. Or just plain Augusto. Senorito Augusto, the very idea. You witnessed my entrance into the world, Pepita. How long ago, it seems. About to cry. Your poor mother. Augusto, abstracted, still preoccupied with himself. Yes, my poor mother. Such is life, some die, others are born, which is which. Who knows, Visconde? No doubt you wonder how it is I come to be up so early. The Visconde knows he's welcome at any hour. It may surprise you, but I have come, my dear, to ask a favor. Oh, Visconde. Pepita, times are hard, although my habits may be... Lowering his eyes. The pace today is a trifle rapid. A man of my age with my advantages. Gazing at himself from head to foot. Well, I must resign myself. Smiles. Love is expensive, and women have become so dreadfully prosaic. I am madly in love with a woman. Why conceal it? You know her. Galatea. Galatea? Who? Precisely. Smiles. Who is looking over your models. Hence the need of secrecy. I do not wish her to see me. Madame Papita moves over and closes the door. Thank you so much. She is a regal creature. Turning to admire himself again in an ecstasy of self-satisfaction. Although, I say it myself, she has exquisite taste. Well, she is certainly hard to please. But she is crazy about me. I am sorry for the poor girl. She is in despair over the question of clothes. You know what models are in Madrid. Finally, I said to her, Why not see Madame Pepita? Oh, Visconde. It will be well worth your while. And so I dropped in myself. Money is no object in this case. When you make out the bill... Oh, Visconde, since you are to pay the bill... No, Pepita, no, not exactly. Unfortunately, I shall not pay. Eh? I adore her, she adores me, but there are complications. In fact, I suspect that somewhere in the background there is some despicable creature who does pay. Sighing. Some miserable old reprobate, at least so I gather from her maid Carmelina, an adorable blonde. Lowering his eyes. Who conceals nothing from me. Madame Pepita, sincerely alarmed. You don't tell me. Permit yourself a little liberty when you make out the bill. I mean, as to price. With an endearing pat. And we'll split the difference. How is that? But, Visconde... Augusto, growing more and more affectionate. Nonsense. Let the other chap do the worrying. Ah, Pepita, you are just like my poor dear mother. Becoming sentimental. She was fond of you. Madame Pepita, overcome, preparing to cry. Yes, your poor mother. But enough of that. Charge her fifteen hundred pesetas. Catalina, entering suddenly without noticing Augusto. Mama, I'm going out to the corner to buy some note paper. Gregoria has asked me to write to her young man. What on earth is the matter with you? Don't you know how to address a gentleman? Oh. Here is the Visconde. Yes, I didn't see him first. 
Well, what else have you to say for yourself? Catalina, offering her hand to Augusto, who takes it gingerly. How do you do? Say, how do you do, Visconde? Augusto, condescendingly. Oh, never mind. Catalina, firmly. I'm sure I don't care. Augusto, insinuatingly. Is this original young lady your daughter? Yes, Visconde, my daughter and my punishment. Very well, then we understand each other. You needn't bother to see me out. Smiling. The girls will be waiting at the door. Retires, accompanied by Madame Pepita, who returns immediately. Catalina, as he disappears... Conceited puppy. She has changed her dress, but is still ungroomed and untidy as before. Madame Pepita, re-entering. Are you still here? Catalina, intimidated. I was looking for my book. Haven't I told you a hundred times not to come in when I have people here, without first dressing yourself properly? Catalina, inspecting herself in the mirror. But I am dressed properly. Madame Pepita, surveying her from head to foot. For what? Catalina, with sincere conviction. I have on a new skirt and a clean waist. And then you've taken a turn with them on in the coal bin. Come here. Pushing her this way and that as she fixes her dress. Aren't you ashamed to be seventeen and not be able to put your skirt on straight yet? Ouch, you hurt. Madame Pepita, still pushing her around. It will do you good. Yes, it's fun for you. Galatea, outside. It's awfully good looking, of course. Madame Pepita, opening the door, which she closed previously. Get out. Somebody is coming. Well, can I go then? Go to the devil if that will do any good. Catalina goes out on the left as Galatea enters on the right. A sewing girl accompanies her, who retires immediately without speaking. Galatea, sniffing the air. Hmm, so he has been here. Madame Pepita, pretending not to understand. I beg your pardon? Galatea, immensely pleased. <laughs> what did he want? I can smell him. I have no idea to what you refer, Signora. How innocent we are! I refer to that rascal, Augusto. Nobody could mistake that odour of tuberose. Deeply gratified. It would have surprised me if he hadn't come. Probably he wanted to find out whether or not I was alone. <laughs> what did you tell him? Suppose he meets the author of his being on the stairs. <laughs> Becoming serious. Well, I ought not to laugh, I suppose. He's been an angel to me. Yes, that's a good joke, isn't it? A real angel. What in heaven's name are we talking about, anyway? I hope you found something to suit. Oh, yes. You have wonderful taste. Madame Pepita, bowing. Signora. There's a blue gown that fairly took my breath away, and a lace negligee somewhat low. Do you get me? Sighing. Oh, it was fascinating. Imagine me, in it. Did you notice a mauve crepe de chine tea gown with a jacket effect of point d'Alençon? It would be marvellous with your lines. Try it on and we can mark the alterations. No, thanks. I don't believe I'll try on anything today. You won't? No, I'm not interested. You might make me up two or three Batiste blouses, perhaps. Don't you know? The cheapest things you have, what you use for chemises will do. And send me a bill for four thousand pesetas. Four thousand? What? Half for you and half for me. My God, a woman has to live somehow. Oh, the bill, but... While you are about it, I don't suppose you'd mind sending it a duplicate. In duplicate? One for the old man and one for the boy. Noticing the horrified look on Madame Pepita's face. While a 
woman's young, she's got to provide for her old age. What are men for, anyway, except to pay bills? There are lots of women who enjoy spending money. Every time they have anything, something else takes their eye. So off they go and buy. Very earnestly. But that's not my style. I've too much sense. The old man is no good. Madame Pepita makes a gesture of dissent. I am merely taking him as an example. No reflections upon you. Tell me, would you put up with him for a minute if he never came across? Of course not. Imitating in pantomime the counting of bills. But the young fellow is all right. Besides, what's the use of denying it? I'm mad over him. But what does he expect? I'm not going to be the only one who loosens up. Take that from me. If you look at it in that light... Light nothing. Look at it as it is. Suppose now I go in for clothes. Clothes cost money, you know that. And you can't raise a cent on them afterwards to save your neck. A woman's a fool to spend money on clothes. Contemptuously. Jewels are no better. You have to pay twenty for what you can't sell for ten. Cash is safer, and land. Every penny I save goes into land. Madame Pepita, impressed. Then you think well of real estate? Yes. The next time you run up to Paris, look out of the window as the train leaves Torre Delones. You'll see a house on the right with a fence painted blue. With a tin summer house in front, with a vine on it? Lovely, isn't it? That's me. Madame Pepita, enchanted. You? Drop off if you have time and look me over. Thanks. I'm usually there Sundays watering my lettuce. A pause. But probably you have more important things to do, and I'm taking your time. No, indeed. Oh, yes, you have. I'll look you up later. Remember, two bills. Don't forget. See you later. I shall hope to see you. I've taken an awful fancy to you. Indeed, I have. Charmed, to be sure. Both go out. After a moment, Madame Pepita returns. Madame Pepita to herself. A thousand pesetas, four thousand pesetas, fifteen hundred, two bills, and all for two Baptiste blouses. God, at this rate I can dismiss the establishment. She goes up to the table and examines the samples that Alberto has left. A noise outside. Then the doorbell rings and Don Guillermo enters, supporting Catalina, pale and frightened. Christina and another girl follow immediately. Madame Pepita, alarmed, rushing up to her daughter. What is the matter? What has happened, Catalina? Catalina, very much frightened. Nothing, Mama. Nothing at all. Don't be alarmed, Signora. Sir? Mama, this is Don Guillermo. The young lady has turned her ankle. Perhaps you had better sit down. Assisting Catalina to an armchair. As she was crossing the street, an automobile almost ran over her. Fortunately, it missed. There wasn't any danger. Naturally, she was frightened. Have you a glass of water? Squeeze a lime in it. Christina goes out. I should suggest an orange. The sewing girl goes out. I'm all right now. I was frightened, that's all. Morning as usual, were you, with your head in the clouds? Don't scold her. Accidents will happen. Catalina insisting. Mama, this is Don Guillermo, the gentleman who lives upstairs. I heard you the first time. Affably to Don Guillermo. This is a great pleasure. We are much obliged to you. Not at all. I was in time to prevent a catastrophe, which somebody else would have prevented had I not been in time. Meanwhile, Catalina has taken his hand affectionately. Won't you sit down? 
Catalina, let go of the gentleman's hand. It embarrasses him. Catalina lets go of Don Guillermo's hand. Don Guillermo, sympathetically. No, indeed. She is a little nervous. The sewing girl re-enters with a glass of water, which Don Guillermo offers to Catalina. Drink this. We had to put vinegar in it because there wasn't anything sweet in the house. That will do. Catalina, almost choking, refusing to drink. Yes, Mama, because Gregoria finished the orangeade yesterday when she had that fainting fit after she had a quarrel with her young man. Gregoria, a fainting fit? The kitchen cat will be having a nervous breakdown next. To the girl. Take this away and go back to your work. The sewing girl retires with the glass. Catalina aside to Don Guillermo. Don't you go away. What was that? Catalina, timidly. I asked Don Guillermo not to go away. But I must. However, I live only one flight up. If you need me at any time, Guillermo de Amandarith is my name. My daughter tells me that you are a very learned man. Don Guillermo, unimpressed. That depends. You are a member of the Academy. Don Guillermo, smiling. I could scarcely avoid that. Avoid it? He says it's a great beauty that I'm such an ignoramus. I never said that, because you are not an ignoramus. Oh, yes, she is. But it's not her fault. It's mine. That is, it isn't mine either. What could I do? I've spent my whole life working for her like a slave, trying to scrape together enough money so that she wouldn't have to go through what I've been through in this world. Tied down as I am to the worry of these miserable clothes, how was I to tend to her education? That's why she's like this. But you needn't think that it isn't a mortification to me, because when God has given you a daughter, or maybe it was the devil, you just want to have her nonplussed ultra, and it's a great grief to me that she isn't. But why am I telling all this to you when you don't know what it is to have a child? That is, maybe you do know. Anyhow, it's none of my business. I don't mean to be inquisitive. Don Guillermo, smiling. No, oh, unfortunately, I do not know. I am alone in the world. When I was young, I had no time to marry, and now that I am growing old, it is too late. My books are to blame, and they console me for what I have lost, which is no more than their duty. Since the subject has been mentioned, I wonder if you would allow me to devote a little of my time to Catalina's education. Education? It seems providential. We are good friends already. We have talked together, and I am fond of her. She is intelligent. Catalina, greatly astonished. Am I? She will learn quickly, I guarantee it. You give her lessons? A member of the Academy? Certainly, Mama. It will be a pleasure. Then I shall feel that my learning is actually of some use in the world. It has all been rather selfish till now. What do you say? Is it agreed? Madame Pepita, greatly affected. Ah, you have no idea how I appreciate this. Throwing her arms about Catalina and bursting into tears. My dear, you are to sit at the feet of an academician. Don Guillermo is surprised. It hardly justifies the emotion. It is not so serious. But I feel terribly, because we are dreadfully unhappy. Naturally, you would never suspect it, but since you're so fond of my daughter, I can tell you. Besides, everybody knows it anyway. We are dreadfully unhappy right here as we sit, because this poor child has no father. You imagine that I'm a widow... Signora, I imagine nothing of the sort. Madame Pepita, hastily. Well, I'm not unmarried. That is, I'm not married either. I mean, 
Yes, I am. But it's just the same as if I wasn't, because my husband... That is, the man I thought was my husband. But you owe me no explanation, so I'm not concerned in the affair. Madame Pepita, without stopping to draw breath. But I want you to know so that you won't think... You see, it was this way. My parents were good, honest people. My mother was a lady's maid and my father butler in the house of the Counts de la Vega de Leso. You have heard of them? But I always had a taste for clothes, so I went with some French women to be a dressmaker in Buenos Aires. And when I got there, I met the father of this child. I was young and impressionable then. He was a Russian, no doubt about that. And we got married, church and all, but without his settling anything on me, because it isn't done out there, and I thought he was the manager of a printing house. But two months afterwards he turned out to be a duke. Yes, sir, a Russian duke, who, because he was the black sheep of the family, had been shipped off to America. And then his father died, and he inherited and had to go back to his own country. But that wasn't the worst of it. The worst of it was that he was a bigamist. A bigamist? Yes, he was married already in Russia to a woman of his own rank, and he ran off with her. So when this poor child came into the world, she hadn't any father. How singularly unfortunate. But I kept right on sewing, and when he got back to Russia he sent me money, for it is only fair to admit he was always a gentleman, and then I came back to Spain and established myself in business. And since I've got taste, if I do so say it myself, we've gotten ahead. Besides, now and then he sent me money. But it's a long time now since he went away, and I haven't seen him for sixteen years, and my daughter doesn't know him at all, and she never will, for we don't even know whether he is alive or dead, and probably he has other children anyway. And here I am, neither married nor single, and not even a widow. So you see that I have plenty of reason for being unhappy. Not so much as you think. You have your health, you have your work, an income, a quiet conscience. Yes, one thing I can say is that my conscience never troubled me. What more do you ask? Love played you a trick. <laughs> In exchange, you have a daughter, a pledge of happiness, a reason for living. You had your illusion of love for a time, but, believe me, even sadder than to have been deceived is never to have had the opportunity. Hereafter you must count me as one of your friends. For the present, I must bid you good-bye. You have my sympathy. Thanks very much. If I can be of any service? Perhaps later. Goodbye. Adios. Don Guillermo goes out. A pause follows. Carmen entering. Madame, the salesman has come with the English samples. Madame Pepita, drying her eyes. Show him into the other room. I shall attend to his case immediately. To Catalina, who is gazing pensively into space. What are you mooning about? Isn't it sad not to be anybody's daughter, and not to have a father like everybody? Madame Pepita, taking her into her arms. You are my daughter. Oh, Mama, we are dreadfully unhappy. We are, my child, we are indeed. Moving off a little and placing both hands on Catalina's shoulders while she looks her straight in the eye. But remember this. One thing consoles me for all of our misfortunes. In my daughter's veins runs noble blood. Curtain. End of Act One. Act Two of Madame Pepita by Gregorio Martinez Sierra, translated by John Garrett Underhill, 1876 to 1946. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Catalina and Don Guillermo are discovered as the curtain rises. 
Don Guillermo paces up and down with the air of a person feeling himself thoroughly at home, while Catalina writes at a small table which has been installed near one of the windows to do duty as a desk. It is littered with books and papers, all in hopeless confusion. Presently, Catalina ceases writing, examining the paper on which she has been working as if looking for mistakes. After conscientious scrutiny, she blots it and lays it upon the table, turning to contemplate her inky fingers with an expression half despairing, half resigned. Upon a second inspection, she becomes even more discouraged as the ink has not disappeared. Finally, running her fingers nervously through her hair, she rubs them upon her apron and heaves a profound sigh. Don Guillermo, turning. Have you finished? Yes. What are you doing now? Catalina, still rubbing her fingers. Wiping my fingers. Exhibiting her hands. I've a little link on them. Don Guillermo smiles. Writing makes me furious. Why? Because it gets my hands in such a state. Hits the pen. I dip it into the ink and it runs up all over the handle. I use the pen wiper just as you tell me to, but the more I wipe, the more ink comes off. Have patience. It will all come in time. Amused. The beginning is always difficult. We shall soon see how fast you get on. Catalina, discouraged. But look at these letters. The L's are all crooked, and the M's are all pointed. It makes me mad. Don Guillermo, smiling. Does it? Because I know how things ought to be, and then I go and do them just the opposite. So although I know, I don't know, and I get desperate. Looking at the paper. The L's ought to be straight. Well, I try to make them straight, and they turn out crooked. So what's the use of knowing? Of course, when I'm wrong, because I don't know, I'm an idiot. But when I know I'm wrong, and then do it, what am I? Don Guillermo, patting her affectionately on the head. You are an intelligent young woman who must work hard in order to overcome the first difficulties and put what she knows to good use. That is precisely what learning means. Catalina, after a pause, looking at Don Guillermo intently. Don Guillermo, what use is learning, anyhow? Learning teaches us to know. Yes, I understand that. But what use is it? Don Guillermo, smiling. You will soon see. It is useful in many ways, which, little by little, you will discover yourself... Even if it were of no use, it would still be the most wonderful thing in the world, because it is the only thing that is satisfying in itself. When we have once peeped into the garden of knowledge, even at the tiniest gate, it is astounding what marvellous voyages we are able to make, and what sights we can see, without taking the trouble of leaving our chairs. I suppose that's why you never notice what's on your plate at dinner and laugh to yourself all the time and walk out on the street without tying your shoes. Don Guillermo is slightly annoyed. What a keen little critic we are. No, I don't mean anything uncomplimentary. Only I can't help noticing what you do, because I watch you all the time. You mustn't think I'm criticising. Everything you do seems right to me. Don Guillermo, greatly pleased. Yes, my dear, I know you are sweet and good, and you are very fond of me. Yes, I am. Artlessly. Are you fond of me? Don't you know it? Catalina, sincerely pleased. Of course I do. I may be stupid about other things, but not about that. I know you are fond of me, because when I broke that jar the other day in the library, you didn't say one word about it, though it was valuable. That's how I know. I didn't mean to. 
You have talent, too, for psychology. Now you're making fun of me. I am very fond of you, fonder than you can imagine, fonder than I could have believed possible myself. I love you better than I do art and science put together. Catalina, after a brief silence. Are we going to begin this all over again? No, that will do for today. I want to tell you a secret. Drawing near, mysteriously. We're rich. Who? Mother and I. Who do you think? We've inherited a million. My father died and left it in his will. We got word yesterday, and Mother has gone to see the lawyer. Nobody knows except Don Luis. He was here last night when word came. Mother says she is going to retire from business because she's sick and tired of clothes, and we're going to Escorial to live. To Escorial? Yes, Mama owns property there, and she says she's going to build homes and rent them, and keep one too for us to live in. There has a big garden with a grotto, and a fountain in the middle, besides a hothouse, where we can grow camellias. The bell rings. Catalina stops short. Here she comes now. Madame Pepita enters, attired in a simple, tailor-made suit of grey or dark blue, also a mantilla. She is visibly flustered and out of breath. Good morning. Madame Pepita, about to pass without seeing him. Oh, excuse me, I didn't notice you. Good morning. I'm so excited I don't know whether I'm on my head or my heels. Has she told you? Yes, indeed. Terribly sad, isn't it? And to think of my being caught without a stitch of black to my name. No wonder they say, go to the cutler's house for wooden knives. Here I am fussing about other people's clothes and I look like a fright myself. I wonder what the notary thought when I walked in in colours on such an occasion. Don't worry. Probably he never thought at all. Sit down. It is a matter of taste. Madame Pepita, sitting down. Oh dear, no. Whatever's right is right. And for my part, I always want to do the correct thing. Poor dear. Think of his remembering us at such a time. He has done no more than his duty. But so nicely. Bursting into tears. Ah, oh, my dear, your father was always a gentleman. They tell me the poor man was ill for over two years, not able to move out of his chair. And all the while he was thinking of us, and we were sitting here calm and collected as could be, without suspecting the first thing about it. Oh, my daughter! Embracing Catalina, who, as befits the occasion, assumes an expression of supreme anguish. Poor mamma. Don Guillermo, removing Catalina. Come, come, you must not upset your daughter. It is not right to grieve like this. Madame Pepita, between her sobs, artlessly. But I'm not grieving. I feel I can tell you because you're so wise that you understand anyhow. Don Guillermo, smiling. In a measure. And that's what makes me feel so badly not to be able to grieve as I ought. Because you see how the man has behaved to us. And I did care for him, yes, I did. He was the apple of my eye. And when it all happened, seventeen years ago, and he left me forever, believe me, it was all I could do to go on living because of my child. And more than once, yes, more than twice, too, I had a mind to put an end to it all. Catalina in tears also. Poor mamma. And now he's gone and died, and they sent me word about it. Beginning to cry again. Before I can cry the way I feel I ought to cry, I have to stop and try to remember how it was I was able to cry then. But there is no obligation whatever upon you to cry. Even if there were, your feelings are beyond your control. You are right there. To compel ourselves to feel what we do not feel is hypocrisy, a fraud upon ourselves. 
because it mortifies our pride to realize that our feelings do not measure up to our expectations. If your feelings do not prompt you to cry, you ought not to cry. Tears, unless they are heartfelt, are injurious. They do no good to the deceased. Madame Pepita exaggeratedly. But you don't know how I loved him. Certainly I do, but your love has evaporated. My perfume which has stood in a wardrobe for years. Today you have been cleaning house. You find the bottle, and it is empty. The contents are gone. They have been dissipated. They have ceased to be. You have forgotten him, so why worry? Little by little our bodies change until, after seven years, not one atom of what we once were remains. Remember, he has been absent sixteen years. Not one vestige now remains of the flesh and blood that glowed and quivered with love for him. You are not the same woman. You are a different woman who has had nothing whatever to do with that man. Madame Pepita, sentimentally. But the soul, Don Guillermo, what of the soul? The soul may recall vaguely the emotions which the body has felt, but it cannot continue to feel them. Madame Pepita, very positively. Well, anyway, it will be safer to go into mourning. And very proper, if it affords you any relief. No, on account of what people will say. After all, remember I'm inheriting a million. Yes, that fact deserves to be taken into consideration. Madame Pepita, to Catalina. Dear, run out and tell Carmen to cut you a blouse from the crepe we are using for the Baroness's tea gown. I'm too upset to think of anything for myself. Yes, Mamma, Don Guillermo. I am going also. It is growing late. Aren't you coming back to dinner? I dined here yesterday, and day before yesterday, and Sunday too, if my memory is correct. And this is only Wednesday. Yeah, what of it? He is coming, isn't he, Mamma? Of course he is. If he isn't here, I always feel as if there must be something wrong with the table. Well, since you insist, you have my sympathy, as you know, though I believe you are to be congratulated. I appreciate it. Greatly downcast. We must do the best we can. Catalina, going to the door with Don Guillermo and taking his hand as if he were her father. Don't forget the meringues you promised. I'll bring them along. As Don Guillermo and Catalina go out, the doorbell rings, and they come face to face with Don Louis, who enters. Each gentleman displays plainly his discomfiture at the presence of the other. The conde turns his back, affecting indifference, while Don Guillermo stares him up and down in disgust, which he does not attempt to conceal. They salute each other, however, the conde remaining frigidly polite, while Don Guillermo mutters an acknowledgement between his teeth. Good afternoon, Senor de Amandares. Good afternoon. Goes out with Catalina. Don Louis, after Don Guillermo has disappeared. Does this good man spend his entire time here? Madame Pepita, smiling. He's giving my daughter lessons. Ah. Apparently to himself, but with the evident purpose of being overheard. Such assiduity makes me suspicious. How so? Don Louis, significantly. We may take that up later. At present... More pressing business demands our attention. Have you had time to rest? Have you recovered from last night? Madame Pepita nods. Have you got the money? Yes. Where is it? Oh, 
Why, as soon as I received it, I deposited it in the bank. The notary went along because I was afraid to trust myself in the street alone with so much money. Have you any of it about you now? No. Why do you ask? I fear you are making a mistake. It is a matter which involves a will. A demand for money may be made upon you at any time, and I consider it important that you have sufficient on hand. I thought so too, but it seems not. The notary says all the expenses have been paid. My poor dear arranged for everything off there on his estate, so that I shouldn't have a thing to do but accept the money. I appreciate your situation. And by the way, do you happen to have four hundred pesetas? Without allowing her time to recover? As a first installment upon a purchase which it is important that you make, a magnificent opportunity, a piece of property next to your own at Escorial, which may be had for a song. A friend of mine is in financial difficulty. Madame Pepita, interested. Is the Conde positive that it is a bargain? It is a gift. If you miss this opportunity, you will regret it all your life, and you will miss it unless you can let me have four hundred pesetas this very day. What would I give if I had the money? Madame Pepita, producing a brand new checkbook from her bag. Well, I'll sign a check. Seating herself at the table, she begins to make out the check. You certainly are in luck. Money breeds money. Um, while you are about it, you might make it five hundred, so as to provide for emergencies. Madame Pepita, rising after writing the check. Here it is. Don Louis, solicitously. Allow me to sign the receipt. Oh, not at all. Conde, I should be offended. As you wish. Now let me offer you a piece of advice. This confidence which you place in me, deservedly, extend to nobody else. Be on your guard. You are rich, and the world is full of scoundrels. They will cheat you, rob you. They will swarm to your millions as flies to their honey. Pepita, if you are not careful, your generosity will be taken advantage of. I myself have abused it not a little. You don't say that, Conde. Yes, Pepita, unavoidably, perhaps, but the fact remains that I have abused it. However, Providence is repaying your kindness with interest. You are rich. Suddenly overcome. God knows I rejoice with you, although this unexpected good fortune obliges me to renounce a dream. It is a subject, however, which, as a gentleman, I prefer not to dwell upon. Madame Pepita, interested. A dream? Don Louis, loftily. Alas! But to an old friend, surely the Conde can tell me? Yes, after all, why not? Now that it has become impossible, what difference does it make? Catalina and Augusto. You must have noticed how they have become attached to each other. Madame Pepita, surprised and delighted. The Visconde and my daughter? Then you have noticed it? No, I hadn't noticed. Pepita, you are blind. I have suspected for some time, but now I am certain. He has practically confessed, under compulsion and it is not surprising. Your daughter is an original creature, unusual, fascinating, and Augusto's temperament is so artistic. It was inevitable. But, Conde, pardon me, the Visconde, I thought, is he the sort of man? My dear, talk. It is all put on. Disappointment will result in irregularities. Men are naturally that way, anyhow. 
when he realized that he had become the victim of an impossible passion, for I may say that it never occurred to him that I would relent, although you are worthy people, your daughter has no father. We are where we are. Madame Pepita, sobbing. Yes, we are. However, it is too late now for regrets. When I found myself confronted with a crisis, I was prepared to lay prejudice aside. Adversity has its uses. But you have inherited money. Thank God! So it is now out of the question. You are rich. We are poor. People would think that we were after your money. Never. Never that. Never. Why, Conde? Never. I could never reconcile myself to such a thing, at least not without a bitter struggle. But my heart aches for my boy. And there is another obstacle. Another? Which is a great deal more serious. What position does the gentleman on the floor above occupy in this establishment? But I have already explained to the conde that he is giving Catalina lessons. But he remains to dinner. He remains to supper. He spends all his time here. He is devoted to my little girl. He is entirely too devoted. We are awfully fond of him, conde. That makes it worse. He is so gentlemanly and refined. No doubt. That is neither here nor there. The question is not what he is, but what you are. These visits compromise your reputation. Besides, there are too many of them. Remember, you are a young and beautiful woman. Yes, I am thirty-seven. With a past. Although it was not your fault. With a past. It is another phase which I prefer not to dwell on. Conde. Your daughter is grown, yet you persist in permitting this gentleman liberties which are extended customarily only to a husband or a father. Oh, no, nothing of the sort. Believe me, there must be some mistake. Morally, I decline to sanction the situation. I had hoped that our children might unite. But you must realize that a name such as mine is peculiarly sensitive to the breath of slander. I could never tolerate such a dubious situation. Not that I wish to criticize your conduct or to dictate in any way. No, do as you see fit. Nevertheless, if this gentleman continues his visits to this house, I shall be obliged to discontinue mine. Interpret it as you may. I shall retire. Regretfully, Pepita, but with dignity I shall retire. Conde! However, I must hurry to place this money in the hands of my friend. Remember, your interests are first with me. If you need advice, come to me. But as it is, I feel that I intrude. Think it over. Think it over very carefully. Do not force me to say goodbye. Au revoir. Goes out. Madame Pepita, surprised and delighted at the prospect of her daughter's becoming a countess, remains behind, completely dazed. My daughter? The Visconde? Impossible. No, it isn't either. Catalina? Catalina! Catalina, appearing in the doorway. Did you call Mamma? Noticing her mother's agitation. Don't you feel well? Yes. No, I don't. Come here. Look at me. How would you like to be a countess? I? A countess? Why? Would you or wouldn't you? Answer me at once. How can I tell? Tell me the truth. Are you in love? I? In love? 
Isn't there anyone you'd like to marry? Are you engaged? Catalina, alarmed. No, Mama, I'm not engaged. But you like someone, don't you? There is someone you're awfully fond of. Don't you find him attractive? No, Mama, not exactly attractive. What are you talking about? Mama, I don't love anybody. The bell rings, and Galatea enters like a whirlwind. Where is she? Ah, oh, give me a kiss. Another one for luck. A hug, too, this time. To Catalina. And one for you. Embracing mother and daughter in turn. Congratulations! You don't know how delighted I was to hear it. Think of it, a cold million. What, potatoes? No, francs. Exchanges at seven and a half. It may not seem much, but when you figure it up... Considering a moment. It comes to 15,000 euros. I wish something like that would happen my way. You knew what you were doing all right when you married a Russian. Now, don't tell me it was love. I've always stuck to the home article. Madrid is good enough for me, although I don't suppose I can teach you anything. Anyway, I'm tickled to death that you've really got the money, because I don't suppose you'll mind so much now about the bill. I've given up hope of the old man, and his son is no better. They simply haven't got it. Not that I care about the boy. I'm silly over him, but the old chap ought to pay somehow. Does he think a man can make an ass of himself at his age for nothing? Madame Pepita, to Catalina, who is displaying keen interest. Catalina, see if the girls are ready to try on your blouse. Yes, run along. Things will be coming your way pretty soon. Catalina retires. She's a lucky girl. God remembers her while she's young. She won't have to go through what you and me have. Look up now that some young whippersnapper don't get after her money. The world's pretty rotten, and I don't know whether a woman's worse off when she has money or when she hasn't any. Because what's the satisfaction of marrying a man and then sitting around watching him spend your money on somebody else? Madame Pepita, moistening her lips. There are all sorts of men. And then a few. You've said it. It strikes me you're a sensible woman. Why don't you break off with the Visconde? With Augusto? Never in the world. You're not getting anywhere as it is, it seems to me. I ought to know that better than you do. I say. I wouldn't give him up if I starved. I could lose everything, but I'd love him just the same. I thought I'd leave him sometimes and march myself off to Paris where a woman can do something. Out of sight, out of mind, don't you know? There's nothing in this for me. But when the time comes, I can't tear myself away. It might be a good idea, though. No, it simply can't be done. I'd feel as if I was committing murder. I love him more all the time, and it's a shame. Last night I started for the station. Did you miss the train? No, he dropped round. Do you know what I've got in this box? Neckties to make up. Whenever I feel I can't stand him any longer, I just run out and buy him a handsome present. Dubiously. Well, I suppose somebody's got to do it. Carmen, entering. Madame. The lady in the Calle de Lista wants you to hurry up those negligees. She says she can't wait any longer. Yes, better let her have something for tonight. I'd forgotten all about her. Dear me, life is just one emergency after another. Congratulations again. I am going. I hear you're retiring from business. If you're selling out cheap, tip me off. I know a good thing when I see one. But don't let me detain you. Madame Pepita retires. Galatea, after adjusting her hat at the mirror, is about to leave by the other door when Augusto enters. Galatea, surprised. Augusto! Galatea! 
Are you here? I was just congratulating Madame Pepita. What were you doing last night? I was out. Smiling. But where were you going? You left no word. I searched all Madrid. I was furious. Don't you love me any more? Galatea, smiling. Search me. Yes, but how about me? I didn't get very far. What are you doing tonight? Galatea, coyly. Is it a date? I must have a moment first with Pepita. I shan't be long. You might wait outside in the motor and then we can go for that ring. I know you've set your heart on it, although I had planned it as a surprise. I've planned a little surprise for you, too. Do you mean it? Galatea, handing him the box of neckties. Promise not to look. Augusto, about to open the box. What can it be? Wait until you are alone. Augusto, kissing her hand. You're an angel. So are you. Peep and see. Goes out. Augusto, after a discreet but rapid glance in the glass. What can it be? Opens the box. Cravats. Becoming sentimental. Although her taste may be bizarre, how she loves me. Kissing a cravat. And how I love her. Rising into transports. Madame Pepita enters, greatly pleased to discover Augusto. Madame Pepita, entering. Visconde. Oh, Visconde. Augusto, coming to, hastily bundling up the cravats. Pardon me? Were you thinking? Thinking? I was trying not to think. Madame Pepita, sympathetically. Visconde. I am in desperate need of seven hundred pesetas. If you cannot let me have them, I shall grow violent. I know you have a million, but I do not ask upon that account. No, I should have had to have them anyway. Life has become insupportable. Oh, Visconde! My heart is broken. What is the good of a heart nowadays? Nobody seems to have one. My heart will be my ruin. A tender heart is a priceless treasure. But so expensive! Man cannot exist without woman. Woman cannot exist without money. Don't let that worry you, Visconde. All things come to him who waits, even when it seems impossible. If you are in trouble, come to me. I have the gift of sympathy. So I am coming to you. Can you let me have the seven hundred at once? I am in a hurry, or I should not ask. Just a moment while I write the check. Madame Pepita retires. Augusto paces back and forth, admiring himself in the mirror. Presently, Catalina enters, approaching the table which contains the papers without noticing Augusto. They collide with a violent shock while he is still absorbed in the contemplation of his person in the glass. Oh, excuse me. Can't you see where you are going? Can't you see anything but yourself, puppy? Making a face which he sees in the mirror. Let me give you a piece of advice, young lady. Don't you make faces at me. If you weren't so stuck on yourself, you wouldn't have noticed it. It wouldn't do you any harm to be a little stuck on yourself. Wouldn't it? Do you take out a license for that poodle effect with the hair? When it rains, don't forget yours is gummed down and glued. Can't you let me alone? Who are you, anyway? Seating herself at the table, she opens a drawing book, in which she proceeds to copy a map. Augusto stalks up and down without speaking. They exchange glances of mutual contempt from time to time, until the entrance of Madame Pepita with the cheque. Highly gratified at finding them together, she beams upon them with maternal tenderness. Madame Pepita, entering. The poor dears are embarrassed. What a picture they would make. To Augusto. The check, Visconde. Thanks. I shall never forget this. 
I feel like another man with this money. I may have to go to work to repay you, Pepita. Love is a great leveler. Ah, oh, for love's sweet sake. I'm off. Rushes out without paying any attention to Catalina. Madame Pepita deeply affected. For love's sweet sake. Looking at her daughter. Poor Visconde. Alberto appearing in the doorway. May I come in? What's the matter with you? No, it's the proprietor who wishes samples of English Point and the gold galloons. They're required. God knows what's become of them by this time. We need them to fill an order just received. Very well. Wait and I'll have them brought if they can be found. Retires, leaving Catalina with Alberto. Both smile and Catalina continues her work. Alberto, shyly. Pleasant day, isn't it? Yes, very. A pause, during which she continues working, while he stands a little way off without removing his eyes from her. Won't you sit down? Thanks. You are very kind. Sits down at the farther end of the room. Another pause. Are you sketching? Catalina, smiling timidly. No, I don't know how to sketch. I'm copying a map. Alberto, unconscious of what he is saying. Ah, a map? It's the map of Europe. Another pause. Catalina draws busily, then stops and sucks her pencil. Alberto, rising. Pardon. Please don't suck your pencil. Eh? It may be impertinent, but it grates upon my nerves. Catalina, ready to cry. It does look horrid, doesn't it? Alberto, effusively. No! You couldn't possibly do anything that looked horrid because... because... well, of course not. Another pause. Catalina draws industriously and breaks the point of the pencil. Oh dear, I've broken the point. Taking a penknife, she hacks a fearful-looking point after great effort, then inspects it with a sigh. Alberto, impetuously, rising again. Pardon, that, that is not the way to sharpen a pencil. This is the way. Rapidly and easily making a perfect point. It's very simple. Catalina, admiringly. Oh, what a beautiful point. You certainly are a handy man. That's my business. Oh, yes, you're an artist. Do you really paint pictures? I should like to, but I do not. Why not? I am too poor. My mother is a widow. Catalina, interrupting, charmed. Just like me. Alberto, without heeding the interruption. Only I have six young brothers and sisters. Mother teaches school in a town not far from here, and she says that only rich people can afford to be artists. So she wants me to be a clerk in La Sultana, as the proprietor is my uncle. She thinks when he dies he may leave the shop to me, since he is a bachelor. And then naturally we'll all be rich, and we can educate the other children. However, I see no indications. <laughs> but of course, that does not interest you. Catalina, earnestly. Yes, it does, very much. I am twenty-two now, and all I do is to carry bundles back and forth to dressmakers and other stupid people who have not the first idea about art. Pardon me. No, you are right. It would be a great deal better to paint pictures. Alberto enraptured. Yes. Wonderful pictures. Marvellous pictures, such as nobody has ever seen before. Palpitating with sunshine and light. Pictures of the sea, the sky, the deep blue Italian sky. Ah, oh, Italy. Rome. Catalina, ingenuously. Rome is here on the map. Rome is in paradise. Is the sky really so blue there? So blue that it is despair of those who worship her. Really? I hadn't heard. 
Funny, isn't it? I've marked the name in blue ink. Mark it in gold and precious stones. Why don't you go if you want to? There's a railroad here, or you can take the boat across the sea. The boat and the railroad cost money, and I have no money. Oh, don't worry about that. How much do you need? Because we can ask Mother for it. Mother? No. Well, that would not be right. Yes, it would. Everybody asks her. Besides, we're rich now. We've inherited a million, and it's in the bank, and all we have to do is sign a paper, and they give us all we want. You are kind and generous, but I could never accept it. Thanks just the same. I shall never forget your kindness. I'm grateful, really. Could I kiss your hand? Catalina, taken aback, hiding her hands. Oh, no. Why not? Because, because they're all covered with ink. Alberto, seizing her hands. What of it? They are lovely. They are dear and sweet. The hands of a generous woman who understands, who sympathizes. Catalina, after a pause. So you do think you will go to Rome, then, after all? Yes, I shall. I have a plan. I work all day, but I study at night. I attend a life class, and when the next competition takes place, I shall enter. I shall win a prize, and then I shall go, no matter what Mother says, and when I come back, I shall be a great painter. I wish you could see the marvellous pictures I shall paint in Italy. Catalina, somewhat anxiously. I suppose while you are there you will paint some lovely ladies. Oh, naturally. Like the ones you were telling us about, with lines, you know, and proportions. When I am famous, I intend to paint your picture. My picture? And win a prize with it. Yes, indeed. But I... I... at least Mother thinks so. Looking at herself in the mirror. And she's right, too. I haven't any proportions at all. Almost reduced to tears. You haven't? And I don't know how to dress or fix my hair. Crying. You can see for yourself. Alberto greatly troubled. No, no, indeed. N not at all. You are... Yes, you are, Signorita. Yes, indeed you are. Choking, almost ready to shed tears himself. You... you... you have character. Catalina, overcome with surprise and delight. I have. Christina enters with two boxes of samples, without noticing Alberto. So you got rid of it, did you? Alberto, moving away from Catalina. It? Oh, are you still sticking around? Here are your samples, and you needn't bring any more, because Madame Pepita is retiring from business. Thank you so much. Christina goes out. Alberto is about to resume the conversation when Don Guillermo enters, carrying several packages, one of which apparently contains a bottle of champagne. Alberto bows and disappears. Adios. Catalina makes no reply. Don Guillermo, stepping to one side to allow Alberto to pass. Adios. Eyeing him curiously. Here are the meringues. Handing the package to Catalina, who takes it mechanically and remains standing with it in her hand. Who is the young man? Catalina, almost choking. It's the boy from the silk shop. Don Guillermo deposits the package upon the table. Don Guillermo is painting a nice business. It is more than a business, it is an art. But is it nice or isn't it? That depends upon how one paints. A good painter has an excellent business. But a bad painter? A bad painter, my dear, cannot exactly be sent to jail. But he belongs there. Catalina, alarmed. Not really. Is it awfully hard to win the Prix de Rome? It will be in the next competition, as I shall be one of the judges. 
I am chairman of the jury. Catalina, torn between hope and fear. You are? Yes. Why all this sudden interest in painting? Don Guillermo, when a painter says that you have character, does that mean that you are pretty or the opposite? Neither. It means that you have something characteristic about you, something original, distinguishing you from other people. It means that you are interesting. But is it a compliment, or isn't it? It is the nicest kind of compliment. One more question. Does a woman have to be a countess because she's rich? Don Guillermo, alarmed. A countess? What makes you ask that? Nothing. Only mother thought perhaps I'd better be one. Don Guillermo, exercised. She did? When? Just now, while you were out, after talking to the conde. Never. There must be some mistake. Why must there? Don Guillermo, greatly agitated. No, you don't have to be a countess. It is absurd, and I shall take care that you don't become one. Never. What's the difference, anyhow? Why fuss so much about it? Don Guillermo, striding up and down, muttering to himself. This is too much. Outrageous. I shall make this my business. Catalina, timidly and affectionately. Why, Don Guillermo? Have I done anything wrong? Are you angry with me? Kissing his hand. No, no. With a paternal caress. I was thinking of something else. To himself. Keep cool. Be calm. Aloud. This is my business. Catalina, affectionately, hesitating what to do. Before you settle down, would you like me to bring your cap and sleepers? Madame Pepita enters. She stops short upon discovering Don Guillermo. Don Guillermo, pleasantly. Well, I am here, you see. Is dinner ready? Madame Pepita, disconcerted. Then, frigidly. Dinner? Don Guillermo, handing her a small package. I brought you some nice ice lady fingers and a bottle of champagne to enliven the repast. We are fond of them, so we shall enjoy ourselves in love and good fellowship. Madame Pepita, visibly embarrassed. Yes. Don Guillermo hands Catalina the bottle. Put this on the ice, too. Oh, by the way... Here are some potato chips a la Inglesa. They are one thing your cook does not do to perfection. Handing her another package. Crisp them. Mind the bottle. Catalina goes out. Don Guillermo to Madame Pepita, making himself perfectly at home. Well, this house has become a vice with me. Doña Pepita... You and Catalina have taken complete possession of my heart. I never cared for a family, but now I could not get along without the illusion of family life which you supply. One of these days you will be removing me from the door with a broom. Madame Pepita, greatly embarrassed, stealing herself with a determined effort. Don Guillermo, that's exactly what I wanted to speak to you about. Don Guillermo, surprised. Eh? Madame Pepita, scarcely able to articulate. Since my daughter has left the room... Don Guillermo, becoming serious. What do you mean? To begin with... Now, don't be offended, it's not as bad as that. That is... It's unpleasant, of course, especially for me, Don Guillermo, because... Well, the fact is, you've been very kind to us and all that, and we can never thank you for what you've done and are doing for my daughter's education. 
I know it can never be paid for, not to speak of your having taken all this trouble, seeing that she's nobody, and you are who you are, and know what you do. I don't say so because she's my daughter, but a princess wouldn't be a great deal for you to be giving lessons to. Yes, but come to the point, what, what do you mean to say? Well, Don Guillermo, circumstances alter, you know, so... What used to be it does seem too bad though doesn't it it can't go on forever you know what i mean oh, i certainly do not explain yourself well we're just two unprotected women and everybody's so ready to gossip about what is none of their business and to make things worse than they are so people might think Especially since I have a past, I'm sorry to say, which is nobody's business either. Anyhow, when people were coming to this house because I was a dressmaker, it didn't make so much difference who they came to see, but now that I've retired, it don't look respectable. Swallowing hard. Do you understand me? I certainly do. Better than I could wish. Madame Pepita heaves a sigh of relief. You think, or somebody thinks for you, that my visits may compromise your reputation, or your daughter's? Virgins and martyrs, don't be offended, Don Guillermo. What hurts does not give offence. But... You wish me, then, to confine myself to giving Catalina lessons? That won't be so easy either, I'm afraid, now that we're moving to Escorial to live. I have absolutely nothing to detain me in Madrid. My daughter is grown and she will probably marry before long, so under the circumstances... Say no more. I understood from the beginning. I merely wish to hear it stated in plain words. You want to get rid of me. No, no, indeed. We shall always be glad to see you whenever you have time. Why not run out some Sunday for dinner? Don Guillermo, after a pause. I see only one drawback to your plan. It won't work. It won't? Don Guillermo, with dignity and restraint. I shall not give up Catalina. Madame Pepita, alarmed. Don Guillermo. Don Guillermo, smiling. Don't take it so hard. As you say, it sounds worse than it is. Deeply moved, but assuming a satiric tone in order to conceal his emotion. I have spent the forty-five years of my life so completely shut off from the world that I have scarcely become acquainted with myself. Now that I look back, I realise that I have wasted my time. My mother was wrapped up in me and watched over me until a few years ago, so that I never had occasion for another woman's love. I grew up a selfish old bachelor, salted down in my books. But the strange part of it is that while I have never cared for women, I have always been fond of children, <laughs> no matter how ugly or dirty they might be as yes, they stumbled along. I yearned to take the little dears by the hand to teach and protect them. Love between men and women is a relation of equals. It may even imply inferiority on the part of the man. Perhaps I'm proud. It is one of my failings. But I have never felt like kneeling before a woman, although I have often had a desire to hold a loving creature in my arms. Don Guillermo, in reality, has been talking to himself, his eyes fixed upon the floor. But when he arrives at this point, he suddenly becomes aware of the presence of Madame Pepita and turns towards her. I beg your pardon. Madame Pepita, vastly impressed, but without understanding one word. Pardon me. Since I have known Catalina, this desire has become concrete. She is everything to me. 
I could not say whether she is quick or dull. I am not sure whether she is beautiful or plain. I cannot even tell you the colour of her eyes, but I feel that she is my daughter, much more than she is her father's. Yes, more certainly much more than she is yours. But it seems to me... Much more. You brought her into the world, but I have brought a new world to her, fresher, more striking, materially and spiritually, than the old. I have rejuvenated myself so as to bring my mind down to her level. I talk like a child so as to companion with her innocence, and I shall gladly forego all the joys of this world and the next, merely for the pleasure of holding her hand while she writes. Why, Don Guillermo? Don Guillermo, firmly. No, I cannot surrender the child. She requires protection, which is absolutely disinterested and sincere. Perhaps you may need it too. I know what I am doing, although you would be entirely within your rights if you put me into the street. I shouldn't think of such a thing. I should not question your decision. Your point of view is as proper as it is absurd. Legally, I have no right to paternity. My position is extra-legal. Yet it can be recognised and reduced to legal status. And the sooner it is done, the better for us all. Don't stare at me. I'm not crazy. Desperate diseases demand desperate remedies. The pill is a bitter one, but I shall swallow it. You are a woman of courage yourself. What in heaven's name are you talking about? I must be accepted in this house as a husband and a father. Otherwise I shall not be free to act. I shall be hampered. Why not face the facts? We must marry and conform to the conventions of society, however inconvenient. I am willing to marry you. You? Don Guillermo, visibly worried. You, yes, and I, if you are agreeable. Madame Pepita, speechless with amazement. You and I? You and I. Pardon my abruptness. You never occurred to me before. I mean, in the light of a wife. But you knew that I had been married. Don Guillermo... More and more disturbed. Be that as it may, this would be a marriage of convenience, pure and simple. Pure and simple? A moral necessity. Love does not enter into it. But we shall be spared embarrassment. You are rich, while I am not poor, which will be sufficient to silence evil tongues although the opinion of others has no influence with me. I have means to support myself and to permit me to indulge in some pleasures, so money will not be lacking. If you will marry me, I offer to defray the household expenses like a good husband while you dispose of your million in any way you think convenient. I shall not even take note of its existence, I am a famous man. My name appears in the papers. I have the entree of the palace, and a place of honour at all court ceremonies, which, naturally, you will share with me. You will be entitled to a reserved seat at the functions of the academy. The doorkeepers will bow whenever you appear. You will be the distinguished wife of an illustrious author, of an eminent critic, who is one of the glories of his country. Whenever a monument is unveiled or a cornerstone laid, you will be among those who remain for refreshments. And if photographs are taken for La Illustration or Blanco y Negro, you will be immortalized with me in the group. But are you in earnest? Don Guillermo, offended. Do I look like a man who would treat marriage as a joke? If that is the case... Your fondest dreams will be realised. 
one of my ancestors, crossed the sea with Hernan Cortes and undertook the conquest of America. He proved so adept at killing Indians that his majesty conferred a coat of arms upon him, which I have somewhere under cobwebs at home. You are at liberty to dust it off, since you are partial to nobility, and to display it upon our notepaper, so that people can see who we are. Madame Pepita, deeply affected. Don Guillermo. And on the door of our automobile, too, for we shall have one. We shall get along faster. It is permissible for a man nowadays to blow his own horn. Greatly excited, striding to and fro, until, finally, he comes face to face with Madame Pepita. Well, what is your answer? It would be very nice, of course. Protection means so much to a woman, especially when it's a celebrated man. But Catalina... With all due respect to the starved aristocracy, Catalina will be far better off as the stepdaughter of a Spanish gentleman than as the natural daughter of a Russian duke. She will be more marriageable, too, and it is no compliment to myself. No, of course not, but I must say you don't seem enthusiastic. I know what I am doing, and that is enough. You are not responsible. But how do you suppose that I feel? My reasons are disinterested, so forgive me. I am anxious, too, to have you satisfied. I am nervous, upset. I appreciate what you are. Besides, I am a gentleman who respects the sex. I do not love you. I shall not pretend that I do. But whatever I have is yours. You'll never regret having accepted my name. A pause. That is, if you do accept it. Madame Pepita, vastly moved. Certainly. What else can I do? But I wonder what my daughter will say. I shall never have the courage to face her. Leave that to me. At the door. Catalina! Catalina! Catalina, outside. I'm coming. A pause. Don Guillermo and Madame Pepita wait, but Catalina does not appear. Madame Pepita, impatiently. Catalina, are you coming or are you not? Catalina, outside. Yes, I'm coming. After a moment she enters not yet quite fastened into a flamingly audacious gown, which scarcely permits her to walk. In the attempt, she entangles herself in the train. Did you call? But what have you been doing? Dressing. What in the devil's name have you got on? It's the latest model. I picked it out myself. I'm seventeen now, and I'm no Cinderella any more. I have lines and proportions, and it's time to show my character. Looking at herself in the mirror, turning halfway round and tripping over the train as she does so. Madame Pepita, staring at her, completely stupefied. You? In that dress? With sudden inspiration... Praise God, it's the Visconde, a miracle of love. Curtain. End of Act Two. Act Three of Madame Pepita by Gregorio Martinez Sierra. Translated by John Garrett Underhill, 1876 to 1946. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Garden of a country house at Escorial, hopelessly modern and in bad taste. A fountain in the middle contains the familiar group of two children huddled together beneath an umbrella. This masterpiece is zinc, painted to look like marble. The ground is neatly sanded. At the rear, 
A wall separates the garden from that of the adjoining house. Morning glories cover the wall, vying in luxuriance with a number of fruit-bearing vines, while above the wall the tops of the trees of the neighbouring garden may be seen. The façade of the house is on the left. The building is an absolutely modern two-storied structure boasting a flight of steps, a glass baldequin, a balustrade decorated with urns which are too large for it, and a crystal ball which hangs from the baldequin in such a manner as to reflect a view of the garden. Half a dozen wicker chairs are scattered about between the fountain and the house, as well as a small wicker table, on which a sewing basket reposes, also of wicker ware. The garden extends some distance toward the right, the street gate being a little farther on. The morning is a bright, sunny one. When the curtain rises, the stage is empty. After a moment, Don Louis appears above the wall, followed shortly by Augusto. They wear light outing suits and broad brim straw hats, and ascend cautiously by means of a step ladder from the neighbouring garden. Don Louis carries a sharp pointed stick in one hand. Don Louis to Augusto, who has not yet appeared. Up, my son. You ought to be ashamed of yourself not being able to climb a wall at twenty-five. Augusto, appearing above the wall in obvious ill-humour. I am able, but ascensions among wallflowers do not appeal to me. You fail to appreciate the delights of country life. Give me air, fresh air. What a morning for filching one's neighbor's figs. Extending the stick toward a fig tree, whose top obtrudes between the wall and the house. Aha! The biggest one. It's for you. Now my turn. Augusto, placing the fig on a leaf, which serves as a substitute for a plate. Why not ask Pepita for them? She would hand them over already picked. It would be more convenient. The pleasures of the chase, my boy. Clarida, sweeter far, than fruits of neighbor's garden are. Bah! Besides, by removing Pepita's figs, we deprive that literary husband of hers of their enjoyment. He has been eyeing them for the past week, watching them ripen to sweeten his lunch. You'll lose your balance and topple over. Don't worry about me. Drawing back a little. Someone is coming. Catalina is heard calling in the house. Papa! Papa! The daughter, down quick! Never retreat under fire. Catalina enters from the house and crosses the garden. She has discarded short dresses and now wears a simple, smart morning frock instead. Catalina, looking about. Papa! He isn't here. Good morning, little rosebud. Catalina, startled. Eh? Looking up at the wall. What are you doing up there? Waiting for you. Me? To tell you how charming you are. Awfully sweet, I am sure. You almost scared me to death. Goes off at the left. Ingratiating creature. Yes. Wait until you are married. Still harping on that, eh? I am more enthusiastic than ever. I could not endure the sight of her painted and gilded. You place your expectations too high. Don't be so deucedly romantic. She is pretty and will learn to wear clothes, to develop personality. Suppose you don't love her. After all, that is not expected. Marry with your eyes open like other people. But she can't endure the sight of me either. What of it? You are young and dress well. That ought to satisfy her. You are noble, besides. I have no money. After you are married, you will have as much as your wife. That follows, naturally. Naturally. My son, we are confronted with a crisis. We have not a penny in the world, and this accommodation is insufferable. Pepita may become disillusioned at any moment. 
and the girl fall in love with another. We subsist as by a miracle. It is absolutely essential that you propose today. Sacrifice yourself. What the devil! If I were in your place, if I were twenty-five, I should sacrifice myself with alacrity. Losing his balance in his excitement, he is about to tumble into the garden. Be careful or you'll fall. Climb down. Mm, perhaps it would be best. We are in no position to argue. Lend me a hand. Uh, oblige me this time and take the stick. What do you care? Steady the ladder. Disappearing. Marriage usually steadies a man, anyway. As soon as they are out of sight, Catalina and Don Guillermo are heard on the left. Catalina, as she becomes audible. I searched through the garden for you. How did you manage to slip out? Don Guillermo, smiling. Now that you have grown to be a young lady, not to say a coquette, you spend all your time dressing. I could not wait. Yes, I am a young lady. How do you like my gown? Very pretty. You look well in it. Do you think it's a good thing for a woman to fuss over her looks, or don't you think so? If she is clean and healthy and there is nothing false about her, I see no occasion for her to fuss. Catalina, smoothing her hair uneasily. I suppose you're going back to Madrid pretty soon, aren't you? Now that the competition is over, there is nothing to take me back. Your protégé will win the prize. Catalina, her heart in her throat. Honestly? Yes, he is certain to be a great painter some day. Then will he have to go to Rome? Assuredly. How are the figs, by the way? I wonder if they are ripe yet. They hang so high that we shall have to climb the tree for them. Get me a basket. Catalina, taking a basket from the table. Put some leaves in the bottom to make it look nice. They retire behind the corner of the house under the fig tree. After a brief interval, Madame Pepita enters breathlessly from the street, hatless but carrying a parasol. Andres, a village lad, evidently impressed but lately into the family service, follows. Ask Paco to help you unpack the crate. Yes, Senora. Then you can go to the masons and tell the headman to come here at once. Oh, and be sure you count the bags of lime and the bricks that the workmen bring very carefully, because the number they charge me for it is outrageous. The way I'm spending money here is something wicked. The conde says he don't need any help to count bricks. He says he's managing your property himself, and he don't want me around when he counts the lime either. Madame Pepita, looking about indignant and surprised. But where are the benches? What have you done with the benches? Didn't you set them out? Just as you said, but as soon as you left we took them away again because... Because what? The gentleman told us to. My husband? Your husband. Why? Because... because he said they were monuments of vulgarity. Madame Pepita, with suppressed ire. Very well. Is there anything else? Madame Pepita, venting her spleen. Only get out of my sight. Excuse me. Goes out. Madame Pepita, pacing up and down. Monuments of vulgarity. Monuments of vulgarity. In mingled rage and despair, Don Guillermo enters. Apparently we raise figs for the neighbours. We're conducting a charitable institution. Discovering Madame Pepita and altering his tone. Hello. I didn't see you. Madame Pepita, sweetly. Why? Is anything wrong? Yes, our figs are gone. We have lost six. Six fat ones oozing honey. The sparrows must have eaten them. Catalina, entering behind Don Guillermo, deeply dejected. No, Mama, it wasn't the sparrows. It was the conda and his son, I saw them on the wall with a long stick. They said they were looking for me, which I knew, of course, was a lie. Of course, they're nothing if not polite. Wishing to cut short the conversation. 
I thought you ought to know, because they are there all the time. Yesterday they reached through the fence in the garden patch and stole all your raspberries, and they threw a stone into the poultry yard day before yesterday and frightened the chickens. So one flew over the wall into their yard, and they never sent it back, because they ate it, if you want to know what they did with it. How perfectly silly. Run in and set the table for lunch as fast as you can. We expect company. Again? Are they coming to lunch again today? Why not? Run in and do as I say. Yes, Mama. Waving to Don Guillermo from the top of the steps. Wait for me. I won't be long. Don Guillermo, waving back. I'll be there before you. Madame Pepita, going up to Don Guillermo. Don't you like it? Certainly. Do you mind their coming to lunch? This is your house. Invite whom you please. You are at liberty to do so. I should be sorry if you didn't like it, because I always feel that Don Luis and Augusto are members of the family. However, if you object... It is a matter of complete indifference to me. Don Luis has some important business to talk over. They were coming anyhow. Relative to the purchase of the adjoining property from one of his friends? Madame Pepita, slightly embarrassed. No, this is about some mines. The Conde felt terribly because that investment turned out the way it did. But this is different. It's a stock transaction. A big company has been formed to take in everybody. If you care to see a plan of the mine... No, thank you. Aren't you interested? No, I have no desire to interfere in the management of your estate. Nevertheless, I advise you to be cautious. Receive this gentleman with a proper warmth, and be careful to confine your expansions to the sentimental sphere where they are not dangerous. When he and his son install themselves as tenants rent-free in the very first house that you build, leaving us to stand around and wait for the paint to dry on the second, I say nothing, but don't let your affections run away with your principal. I warn you, you're heading straight for ruin in the arms of your friend. Madame Pepita, sentimentally. Everything Don Luis does seems wrong to you. If you're going to cry over it, I shall retire. Lose your money and enjoy yourself. I am willing. Madame Pepita, verging towards tears. It is awfully hard to please everybody. You are under no obligation to please me. Madame Pepita, as before. But I'm sure I'd like to. <sighs> that is, if such a thing is possible. Don Guillermo, surprised. What is the trouble now? Madame Pepita, assuming a martyr there. Nothing. Although, we had better talk of something else. Don Guillermo stares at her. You had those benches taken away that I had set out. Oh, is that what you have against me? Yes, I did. Pardon my interference in your domestic arrangements. But for once it was too much for me. Artificial stone, imitation trees... I cannot abide the abominations. They are... Monuments of vulgarity, is that it? Worse, they are immoral. Immoral? I cannot see how. There were no statues on them. Staring at him as if he were crazy. What is there immoral in a statue? It is the deception of the thing. Madame Pepita, failing to understand... Deception? Yes. Benches which pretend to be stone and make believe to be wood when they have never even seen a forest or a quarry. They dissemble their true nature. They are impostures. This door which looks like mahogany when it is miserable pine. These solid marble children who at heart are hollow zinc. These bars and gratings which pass for wrought iron and are the cheapest of calamine. They are impostures, cheats, perpetual lies. In a word, they are immoral. Furthermore, they are ugly. 
But if all our furniture has got to be genuine, it will cost a fortune. Then go without. Don't counterfeit. These everlasting frauds which deceive nobody but ourselves create an atmosphere of deception. How do I know that a woman who swathes her neck in cat's fur, which is dyed to look like sable, will not as easily deceive her husband if she has the opportunity? Don't suggest such a thing. Suppose somebody should hear. Andres enters. Signora, the crate is unpacked. Do you want us to bring it in, or what shall we do with it? Yes, bring it here. Andres retires. Madame Pepita turns to Don Guillermo. I'm so glad it came just when we were talking about art. You'll like this when you see it. Andres and a second youth enter. Between them they carry a life-sized figure of a hideous negro, seated in a chair, smoking a cigarette. Where shall we put it? Madame Pepita, ecstatically. Set it there. The boys set the negro carefully upon the ground. Don Guillermo clasping his head with his hands. Merciful powers! Madame Pepita, delighted. Do you like it? Discouraged. You don't like that either. Sinking into a chair and beginning to cry. But, Pepita, don't cry, please. It's not worth it, really. Shall we leave it there, Signora? I don't know. Anywhere. Throw it down the well. No, stand it in the hall. It was intended for the hall, was it not? Madame Pepita, through her tears. Yes, for the hall. Put it where it belongs. The boys mount the steps and stagger into the house. Don't feel so badly. Relenting. It's too awful. If you like it, I am satisfied. Only don't cry. I must go to the city on business. I may have time yet to run to the station and catch the express. Forgive me, Catalina. What has become of Catalina? Catalina, appearing at the window. Did you call? What do you say to a stroll to the station? I'll be ready in a minute. I finish the table. Wait under the pine tree. Bring your hat along. It's growing pretty hot. Don Guillermo withdraws. Catalina waves to him from the window. As soon as he has disappeared, her mother calls her. Catalina! Yes, Mama. Come here, I want to speak to you. Catalina leaves the window, descends the steps and goes up to her mother. What is it? Sit down. What is the matter with you? You are all excited. No, my dear. I've been discussing art with your father. I knew it was something awful. Sometimes, my dear, a woman does feel sentimental. Yes, Mama. And, my dear, it is my duty to warn you. We have invited to lunch... The Conde and his son. But I didn't tell you that they are not coming merely for lunch. Aren't they? What else do they want? They, or rather we, expect you and Augusto to arrive at an understanding. We are anxious to have it settled. Settled? Yes, your engagement. My engagement? Don't be silly. You know what I mean, though you are so coy about it. Augusto, I mean the Visconde, is willing to marry you. It's an honor. No. Yes, he has consented. Never. Never? I don't love him. How do you know whether you love him or not when you've never been in love? You will find out after you're married. I shall never love him. I don't see why. He is young and handsome and dresses well. He frizzles his moustache with an iron. To make it curl. A man's moustache oughtn't to curl unless it curls naturally. It must be genuine. Truth is more important than anything else in the world. You too! Yes, me too, Mama. Madame Pepita, rising nervously. This is a pretty state of affairs. Seizing Catalina and shaking her, greatly incensed. Catalina, this is shocking nonsense, the chatter of a silly little parrot. 
You are going to marry Augusto because it's the best thing you can do. Besides, he's a fine fellow and he's crazy about you. You'll be a countess then, which has been the dream of my life. I only wish I was in your place. He's good enough for you anyway, considering who you are. I'm my father's daughter, Don Guillermo's daughter, remember that. Don't you come that on me. But mamma, he loves me and he is kind to me and I love him. If you insist on my marrying, I'll run and tell him and he'll protect me and you'll find out then whether or not I marry. You'll marry because I tell you to. And be very careful how you say I will and I won't to me. You silly girl, do you know what you are doing? Making faces at your happiness. I suppose you've got some snip of a prince tucked away up your sleeve? No, I haven't got any prints there, and you needn't think you can work off any vicondas on me either. Wait! You forgot you're unmarried. What good is an unmarried woman anyhow? That's the reason she's unmarried. Your happiness is at stake and some day you'll thank me for it. A mother's duty is to protect her children. Yes, and so is father's. I'm going to tell father. Oh, let up on father. Let up on father? Yes, your mother is talking now and your mother comes before everybody else in the world. It would be nice, wouldn't it, if a man who has known you only two or three weeks... I won't have you talk like that about father. Beginning to cry. You don't love him. Whether I love him or not is none of your business. Don Louis and Augusto appear at the left. Do we intrude? Madame Pepita composing herself. Oh, no. Come in. Come right in. To Catalina. You stay here with me. But father... To hell with father. Send word out you're engaged. We anticipate, perhaps. But I am impatient to conclude that transaction. Ah, yes? About the mines? Yes. Glancing significantly towards Augusto and Catalina. About the mines... We might look over the plans in the house, where it will be more convenient. No doubt something of the sort would be best. Meanwhile, the young people may enjoy themselves in the garden until luncheon. Yes, it will not be ready for a long time. Catalina, pulling at her mother's skirts. No, Mama. Don't be so damn gothic. To the Conde. After you. Precede me. They mount the steps and disappear into the house, closing the door behind them. Augusto and Catalina remain alone. They look at each other but say nothing. After an interminable silence, Augusto ventures a remark as gracefully as the state of his feelings will allow. Would you care to take a little walk? You don't call it walking, do you, in the garden? I do. I do not. You do not. Walking is climbing mountains and scrambling over rocks and crashing through the underbrush. I adore walking. I do not. Oh, don't you like mountains? When I hunt. Do you like to hunt? I do. I do not. You do not. It's silly for a grown man to spend all day killing poor little animals who have never done him any harm. It would do you a great deal more good to stay home and read a book. Do you like to read books? Very much. Do you? I do not. Well, what do you like? I like horses and dogs. Oh, I think dogs are disgusting. They jump all over you and upset things and eat everything there is in the house. Besides, they have fleas. I would rather have a canary. It's pretty, and it sings. You don't call that singing, shrilling because it is shut up in a cage. I hate anything that's in a cage. Canaries are in the same class with yellow novels and romantic girls. Don't you like romantic girls? I don't like any kind of girls. You do not? I like women who have spirit and nerve, blood and fire, who know something and are not ashamed to show it. They may laugh at a man and have no use for him twenty-three hours out of the twenty-four, 
but in the one hour that they do, they make him live or they take his life away. I forgot I was talking to you. Oh, don't stop on my account. I suppose you mean something superior. Well, I'm afraid I'm dreadfully romantic, and I haven't got much fire in my blood, not a bit of it. In fact, although sometimes I do get hot when I think... Of a man? Is it some man you already know or one you would like to know? Tell me, what sort of man would you like for your husband? Now don't be offended. I would like a real man, not as elegant as you are, but one who seems like a man who knows something about art, for instance, and is willing to travel to Rome, if necessary, and become famous. He might be a painter. I don't care whether he is noble or not. He might belong to the people, no, not to the people either, but his mother might be a schoolteacher. Augusto, seizing her by both hands. Really? You are an angel. What? An archangel, an extraordinary woman. Catalina, more and more alarmed. Oh, it is true then. You do want to marry me? No, positively I do not. Then why do you say all these things? That's it, exactly. Because I don't want to marry you because you don't love me. Because you love somebody else. I do not. Yes, you do, though you may not know it. I have no idea who he is, apparently a painter or something of that sort, thank God. Now don't be offended, I don't love you either, although I think better of you than I did, and I am grateful beyond measure. Thank you again, oh thank you, thank you. Kissing her hands. Catalina, allowing him to kiss her hands, so completely indifferent that she attaches no importance to it. It is certainly a great relief to us both, but wait till Mama hears. And Papa. Catalina, tapping the ground with one foot. She says I ought to take you because you are a visconde. Yes, and then you know you are rich. But I'd rather throw in my title for nothing. And you could have all my money. However, that is impossible. I fear so. What shall we do? Think of something. You're a man. I? I can't think. Catalina, having an inspiration. No, we had better ask Father. He's not awfully enthusiastic about it either. Come and find him, or perhaps I had better go alone. You can slip out by the orchard gate. Mother and Don Louis will believe, then, that we are still together. How do you like that? Perfect. Hurry and separate and fool them both. Hurry while I get my hat. Augusto runs out behind the house. As Catalina reaches the steps, she notices her mother's parasol, which leans against a chair where it has been forgotten. This parasol will do. What's the difference? An automobile horn is heard. An automobile. Distressed. Who can it be? Hesitating. Oh, well, never mind. As she is disappearing, Galatea enters. Oh, Madame Galatea. Going up to her pleasantly. How do you do? Galatea, frigidly. How do you do? Catalina, after looking at her. Something is the matter. Mother is inside. Won't you step in? Thanks. I have business with you first. With me? Won't you sit down? Galatea, walking nervously to and fro, looking about in all directions. I'm easier as I am. Catalina, curiously. Perhaps you have lost something? Yes, and you have picked it up. I? My dear, think it over. Or all these sweet dreams of yours may turn out to be nightmares. Catalina, amazed. Nightmares? Depend upon it. As long as I'm alive, that man is never going to marry anybody but me. Catalina, astonished and shocked. What man? So you want me to stage this little scene, do you? I? What scene? Unless you make it a good deal plainer, I shan't understand one word you say. You want me to make it plainer, eh? Yes, make it plainer. Well, is this plain enough? 
You think you're going to be a damn countess? Why, I never heard of such a thing. What are you doing with our gusto, anyway? Oh, so it's a gusto, is it? Is that what you're so mad about? Do you want to marry him? That's my business. I think so, too. Well, if you love him and he loves you, go ahead and marry him. Count me out of it. Don't you love him? No, and I never did. I can't stand the man who parts his hair with a ruler. Galatea, offended. Parts it with a ruler? Yes, that's what he does, and he wears corsets and rouges, although you do yourself, so you've nothing on him there as far as that goes. Galatea, uncertain whether to be pleased or not. But there must be some mistake. I thought I heard that you... Perhaps I heard it myself, but you can't always believe what you hear. No, but when you're fond of a man... Are you fond of him, honestly? I'm fond of him, all right. It's hard for me to believe it. However, I understand your position. A woman cannot get along without love. She may suffer, she may wish she was dead and worry until she has not one hair left on the top of her head. But, after all, when you come down to it, love is love. There's nothing else like it. Catalina absorbed. I feel as if you might be a great help to me. Have you been engaged very long? Galatea, depressed. I've never been engaged. Never engaged? And it's too late now. I was starving and needed the money. Do you really mean you were hungry? Galatea, smiling at her innocence. Oh, that was a long time ago. But I could starve all my life for that man. You're a lucky girl. Some day you will have a sweetheart yourself and be engaged. You'll understand then what love means. I hope I will. Galatea, preparing to leave. We all go through it. However, there is no need for you to worry. Are you in a hurry? Why don't you wait for Augusto? No, I guess he's safe with you. But remember... Goes out. Don't forget yourself. Puzzled, watching Galatea as she disappears. She's in love. Just imagine it. Ha, huh, before you can be in love, you have to find someone who is wheeling. Alberto enters. He is dressed as an artist, by which it is to be understood that he wears a flowing tie and a broad-brimmed hat. Good morning. Advancing. Catalina, startled and happy. Oh! Don't be afraid. Disconcerted himself. But I didn't know you were there. Alberto, dreadfully embarrassed, but making an effort to maintain his dignity. Yes. That is, I was in the street looking for you. For me? Alberto, apologetically. No, not for you. For Don Guillermo. I wish to thank him. Don't you know? Oh, yes, of course. The gate was open, so... But I frightened you. Catalina, hesitating. Then you did win the prize. Yes, thanks to Senor de Armendariz. That wasn't the only reason. The picture had to be good, too. It wasn't bad, although they said the subject was a little worn out. Jacob wrestling with the angel. Yes, I should never have won the prize on that. The other pictures were good, too. There were two or three good ones, but Don Guillermo preferred mine because... Because why? Because... because he thought the angel looked like you. Catalina, overcome. The angel? Alberto, apologising. Yes, but you mustn't think that I did it on purpose. Oh, didn't you? No, I just had you in mind. I seemed to see you, that was all. Your head is so characteristic, and your curls, and your wonderful eyes. After I had seen you and we had talked a little, it came to me as a revelation, just like that. Catalina, after a pause. I suppose you are awfully anxious to go to Rome, aren't you? Awfully. Catalina, after another pause. 
you must be very happy. Yes, that is, I should be, very, because I have done what I set out to do. It is my career. Italy is my dream. Catalina, sadly. I know. But then, I am sorry to go. Honestly, I should rather not. Manifestly embarrassed. Why not? Alberto, repenting his indiscretion before it is too late. Because... because I'm awfully fond of Madrid. Oh, are you? However... However? However, I am fond of it, and so are you, although you don't live in Madrid anymore. No, I live in the country. Yes, in the country. Are you fond of the country? I am fonder of it than I am of Madrid. Are you? Why? Because... Catching himself. There are so many trees in the country. Are you fond of trees? Very. If you are. Catalina, touched. Oh, yes, indeed. Restraining herself. If you are. I am fond of everything that you are because... Because you have such excellent taste. I? What makes you think so? Because... Throwing restraint to the winds. Because you have such beautiful eyes. Catalina, overwhelmed. Have I? Alberto, embarrassed. Now excuse me. Yes, you have. They are blue. Do you like blue eyes? Immensely. Catalina, coquettishly. But my eyes are not blue. That is, they are not entirely blue. No, not entirely. Can you see any green in them? Yes, green. Decidedly. But it makes no difference to me. Of course it makes no difference to you. Alberto, fervently. Absolutely not. What do you care what colour my eyes are, anyway? That is quite different. Is it? Yes. Hopelessly embarrassed. If you were nothing to me, of course I shouldn't care. Pardon my saying so, but you can never be nothing to me. You could not be indifferent. Oh, couldn't I? Alberto, impetuously. Never. I must tell you, I know it's not right, but I'm very unhappy. You are rich and I am poor. Only a poor artist. All I have is my future. A hope of glory. Merely a hope, that is all. It is little enough to offer a woman in exchange for happiness. Catalina, wishing to appear oracular. It may seem little enough to you, but it's an awful lot right now to me. No. Because I have money, you think I must be hard to please and want the earth besides. Men always think they know so much. They imagine that they are the only ones who have ideals or can dream about the future and things that can never be. Well, let me tell you, women do it too. Though they may be ignorant, they are just as anxious to go to Rome as men are. She begins to cry. Alberto, deeply moved. Catalina. Catalina, without raising her eyes. Here I am. Alberto, drawing nearer. Catalina. Catalina, discovering Don Guillermo, who enters. Papa. Don Guillermo, without noticing Alberto. Hello, are you here? I was waiting for you. Catalina, with a tremendous effort. Alberto is here, Papa. Alberto? Alberto, advancing. Alberto Jimenez y Vergaras, at your service. Don Guillermo, slightly surprised. Ah, yes, I am delighted. I have come to thank you for... for... Catalina, interrupting. For his prize. Don Guillermo makes a deprecatory gesture, indicating that it is not to be mentioned. And while we were about it, I thought I would tell you that he has asked me to go to Rome with him. To Rome? With him? Impossible. Catalina, blushing. We can get married before we go. Outrageous. To Alberto, angrily. I demand an explanation, sir. It was all my fault. 
Your fault? Yes, he was poor, so he was afraid to ask me because I am rich, and so I had to ask him. It's the same thing anyway. I love him, and he loves me. This is too preposterous. And if you won't let us marry, I am going to die or shut myself up in a convent. While Don Guillermo and Catalina are speaking, Don Louis and Madame Pepita enter from the house. Madame Pepita listens in amazement and turns, unable to restrain her indignation. Madame Pepita to Catalina, seizing her by the arm. What is all this nonsense? They are in love and want to get married. Yes, yes we want, we to, want get to get married. married. But Augusto... Yes, what about Augusto? He doesn't love me, and he is out of it. He is in love with another woman. You don't know what you're talking about. He is in love with Galatea. She's just been here, and she swears Augusto will never marry anyone else as long as she is alive. Galatea? That shameless hussy? Leave her to me. I shall attend to her case. No, it has been attended to already. We shall see. As long as your activities in this house were confined to checking up lime and bricks, I remained silent. I hesitated to arouse my wife. Now, however... Do you dare to insinuate? As I am infinitely more interested in Catalina's happiness than in her mother's bricks... I shall not tolerate any further interference from you. Then you imply, sir... That the time has arrived for you to go, remove yourself. We are not in the habit of discussing family affairs in the presence of strangers. Turning his back. Madame Pepita is struck dumb. Very well. I shall retire. What shocking bad taste! Pepita, you will regret this. You will think of me when I am gone and you are pining away, alone with this man. Remember, you have my sympathy. Goes out. Madame Pepita to Catalina. Because Augusto may have made a few slips, is that any reason why I should permit you to... Certainly, Mama. Madame Pepita, looking scornfully in Alberto's direction. With that man? Certainly, Mama. My daughter, the daughter of a Russian duke, marry a clerk who is a retailer? He's an artist. In a few years he will be famous, I guarantee it. He will paint pictures, win medals, and in the course of time be elected to the Academy. Sadly... Perhaps in my place. Some families seem predestined to glory. You will have a great man for your husband, as your mother has had before you. <sighs> All the same, a title would have done no harm if we could have had it thrown in. I don't want anybody to say I am an unnatural mother. Catalina, embracing her. Nobody ever accused you of that, Mama. We are much obliged to you for what you have done. Madame Pepita, deeply affected. Children are a constant source of anxiety. But I must not miss my train. I am nervous. If there is nothing I can do, Madame Pepita, Don Guillermo, I can never thank you sufficiently. My wife deserves no thanks. God help us both. Adios, Catalina. Adios. They look at each other, too embarrassed to move. I must be going. Yes, you really must. If I am to return, the very first thing in the morning. Be sure you don't forget. Don Guillermo smiles. Alberto, confused. I am going. I am going now. Adios. Disappears. Catalina gazes after him without daring to follow. Run along and see him off if you want to. Everybody is willing. Catalina runs out. Well, she seems happy, I must say. 
This has been a great day. She's going to leave us. Don Guillermo, pacing up and down as he repeats his wife's words. Yes, she is going to leave us. Suddenly realising their significance. Going to leave us? True, she is going to leave us. The poor dear. Don Guillermo, startled, staring at his wife as if discovering her for the first time. And I am left alone with this woman. Guillermo. What luck. Catalina is going to marry naturally. She will live with her husband. Then what will become of me? I have nothing to detain me here. There is no time to lose. I have an invitation to visit Egypt to conduct excavations. Not in Egypt? Yes, of long standing. But you cannot go alone. Don Guillermo nods. What is to become of me? Don Guillermo, uneasily. You? She assents. You can stay behind. The trip would be too fatiguing. Besides, you could never make up your mind to leave all these objects of art. Madame Pepita, on the verge of tears. True, I forgot. Aren't they lovely? I know you only want to get rid of me. Nonsense. How could I? It mortifies me to think that my husband... Although, strictly speaking... But you grow fond of a dog when you live with him. After my experience with that man, it never occurred to me that I could love another. But my heart is tender and I couldn't help seeing what you were. You happened along and, after all, you are my husband, though I am not the one to say it, and I am your wife and... and... I love you. Pepita, do not prevaricate. No, I love you. I wish to God that I didn't, but it's too late now, and I love you. Bursting into tears, she sinks into a chair. And there you are. Don Guillermo, dumbfounded. Pepita, but, Pepita, come, come. I had no idea. Going up to her. Don't cry now. You unman me. Madame Pepita, sobbing. I am nobody, and you are a philosopher, and you belong to a different class, but I love you. I don't care whether you love me, only it isn't my fault. Don't go away because I can't bear it. I've lived alone all my life without anybody to take care of me. My first husband ran away, but I had my daughter, and I shared her with you because you said you needed her. But now she is leaving me, and if you leave me, too, you take the heart out of my life. Pepita! There is nothing left. Please forgive me. A man may be an egotist, but not to that extent. I was not thinking of you. You are alone in the world. You have been deserted. But so have I. I do not ask you to love me. It is more than I could wish. But you deserve it. I know. You have no idea what it means to a man to have a wife at his side. Old age is coming on when it is sad to be alone. No, I cannot refuse the offer of a generous woman's hand. Madame Pepita, sitting up. Guillermo, this is so sudden. Don Guillermo, stifling a sob. We we might spend our honeymoon in Egypt and conduct explorations by the way. Guillermo. And they fall into each other's arms. Catalina enters, flushed and confused with the remorse of the first kiss. Her eyes open wide as she discovers her mother with Don Guillermo. After hesitating a moment... She smiles discreetly, smoothing her disordered hair. Papa and Mama. Tiptoeing out. Something new. Curtain. 
End of Act 3 End of Madame Pepita by Gregorio Martinez Sierra Translated by John Garrett Underhill, 1876-1946